Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, the fourth meeting of the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee of 2022. And uh, we have a number of items this morning. The first item on our agenda is the consideration of continuing petitions and an evidence session. And it's petition number 1896, which is to provide every primary school child in Scotland with a reusable water bottle. Uh, this uh, first petition uh, has been presented to us by Callum Eisted, and it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to replace the disposable water bottle provided with memory, many primary school lunches with a sustainable reusable metal bottle. Now, Callum, good morning. Welcome. Is our youngest ever uh, petitioner to the Scottish Parliament. We're absolutely delighted that uh, he's found time to come in and have a chat with us today about, about his petition. Uh, so it's the warmest of welcomes to him. He's joined by his uh, dad, James. Welcome to James as well. His mum, Sarah, is in the gallery. And we also have with us his local MSP, Sue Weber, who I'm very jealous has already been gifted a very fancy and appropriate reusable, reusable water bottle, which is very colour toned as well, it turns out, for, for Sue as well. So, Callum, it's great to have you with us. And I suppose the first question is just tell us a little bit about yourself, how old you are, which primary class you're in at school um, and why you, why, you, why you decided to do this. So I am seven years old and I'm um, in primary three. At Deadwood Primary. Is it a big class or are there a lot of people in it? Yes, there is a lot of people. Yeah, and you've got a lot of friends in there as well, I hope. Well, a few. <laughs> well, yeah. A, a few. few. And where, where was the school again? Just which, Is it a big school? Yes. Lots of people at it. Yeah. And what's your favourite sort of favourite subject at school? Definitely maths. Oh, well, well, that's very encouraging. I was absolutely hopeless in maths, as to be said. So, well, that's great. So you're here because you've lodged this petition, and I wonder if you'd just like to tell us why you thought it was a good idea to have this petition uh, and what you hope it will do. Why did you think it would be a good idea to, to write to the Scottish Parliament? Because we could get things done for it, or is that? So, I wanted to go to Nicholas Sturgeon's house to go to to go and speak to her about the bottles, but my mum said it wasn't allowed. Then we looked online and found the petitions. Ah. Oh, so we were second choice, but, <laughs> uh, but well, in fact, I raised this with the fact you were coming in with the first minister last week at a meeting of all the committee group conveners, and she was uh, very keen to meet you. And I gather you're going to be seeing the first minister in a little while as well, so you can actually discuss the petition with her. Is that correct? Yes. That's great. And what are you going to say to her? I really do not know that. <laughs> well, I hope you're going to get, uh, do some straight talking and do, not let her flannel you with put you off. You make sure you get straight through it. But essentially, you obviously want everybody to have a reusable water bottle. And is that the sort of water bottle that you're thinking of that you have with you today? Well, it's the yellow one, not the black one. What's special about the bottle? So... Instead of getting a reusable plastic one, I would have got a reusable metal one because the reusable plastic ones break too easily. Right. OK, well, that's great. And we're, going to, we're all going to just ask you a few wee questions and just to get some handle on all of it. So, David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Callum. And in 11 years I've been on the public petitions, I could never recall anybody half your age, far less as young as you. So um, well done and uh, welcome to public petitions. Before I ask you questions, what's your favourite sport? Football. Football. What team do you support? Manchester United and Rangers. Oh. I'm not saying what Scottish team I support because uh, they're in the headlines quite a lot just now. But uh, I'm a Leeds United fan. <laughs> anyway, you see um, all the plastic bottles. When did you first notice in school that there was lots of um, children using plastic bottles? In the last lockdown, 
February 2021. So everybody in your class was using plastic bottles, nearly? Y yeah, all, everybody actually, everybody in my class. And why do you think they shouldn't use plastic bottles? Because I can see you've got lots of them in front of you there just now. Because if, because animals could get injured or die if they are litter and humans could get ill or if they eat a fish that has that has eaten plastic. These are called microplastics. Ah. Can I, can I just say, Callum, um, I know um, as somebody who does a lot of litter picks, Plastic bottles is probably the most common thing that we pick up in trees and bushes around Kirkcaldy and the surrounding areas. So we're really bad for environment. And I'm really, really glad that you've brought this petition to committee today. And in fact, I'm so impressed, especially at your age. Um, because usually boys your age are looking for two fairies for money and things like that, <laughs> rather than bringing petitions to the parliament. So um, can I say it really, really well done? OK? Thank you. Thank you. David, I mean, he might be looking for the money for these teeth as well, actually, so I don't, don't shortchange him there. Um, <laughs> Ruth Maguire. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Callum. My name's Ruth. Thanks for coming to talk to us. Would you be able to tell me a little bit about your eco group? I heard that you did some, some work with them in your school. So we have meetings and also meetings with other schools. We've teamed up with another school called Dumbling Primary and we're trying to fix the broken taps. I was interested to read a little bit about that. Did You, you, you um, did something about the broken taps in your school, didn't you? Could you yeah. tell the committee about that? So, um, some, in my class, there's a hot tap and a cold tap that's broken. And, and see, in my area, there's only two taps, and both of those taps are in my classroom. So everybody, if they need taps, has to come all the way to our primary okay. class. And there's only one place to fill your water bottle up, and that is in P4. OK. And, and you, did you do something about it when the taps weren't working? Did you get some help from one of the adults in the school? Yes. Who did you go to for help? Mrs Mohammed and my eco group. OK. And the janitor fixed them for you? She's not replied to our letter yet. Oh, OK. I'm sure she will. This will be a wee reminder for her. And who else have you spoken to about this? Because you've not just come straight to the Parliament, have you? You've spoken to lots of people. So I've spoken to my head teacher, Mrs French, and the STV, 4F1, Radio Scotland. I think that's what it's called. Um, John Radio Scotland this morning, you did very well. You sounded less nervous than some of my colleagues sound sometimes. You did a, a really good job. And I also spoke to the council. Mm -hmm. And I also spoke to the BBC. OK. Well done. You've done a really good job. And fourth one. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Ruth. Out of interest, Callum, what did the council say? Did they, uh, they, because the council, obviously... Um, manage all the schools. They could be one of the people that one of the groups that actually gave your gave everybody a, a reusable water bottle. Are they a way to think about it? Um, uh, the bottles costed money, so um, and they made the bottles optional. Right. Oh well, when we're paying for baby boxes, I mean, I think you know, there's uh, a, a water bottle doesn't seem like such a big additional expense. Paul Sweeney. Well. Oh, sorry. A, yes, Paul, I think. We'll go to Paul. We'll do, just do it the other okay, way. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you, convener, um, and welcome to our committee, Callum. It's great to hear from you today. Um, so I heard um, that you went to visit COP26 last year um, in Glasgow. Did you have a nice time there? Yes. 
What was your favourite thing about COP26? The big bouncy castle that had water inside it. Right. See the bouncy castle? I'm, I'm gutted <laughs> I missed that. I saw the big giant planet the, um, that spun round. That was really cool. Um, I thought that was really interesting. But also what was really cool is I got a reusable water bottle when I visited COP26. And I think everybody who came to visit Glasgow for the conference got a reusable water bottle. So when you brought your petition, I thought, why don't we give our own children the same thing? Why are we giving all these VIPs the, the say, these, these metal reusable water bottles? Did you think um, it was a bit of a double standard? Do you think it's important that we set an example if we're doing it at COP, we should do it for kids as well? I didn't even know noticed they were doing that. Oh, really? All right, OK. Well, I'll need, to, I'll need to send you one, then. <laughs> no, I've already got two. All oh, right, OK, well, that's fine. Three. Well, I got, I, I've got one with COP26 written on it, so that was quite cool. But it, it probably peels off after a while, so <laughs> it's not such a good thing. Um, so who did you meet at COP26? What kind of people did you go and see? So I met BBC, and I met the boss. Oh. Stephen, he is very nice. OK, brilliant. So there was a lot of bosses at COP26, a different kind, so at least you got to see some important people. Did you talk to them about your idea? Yeah, head of the science In... museum. Uh, they already knew it as well. Oh, brilliant. That's fantastic. And did they agree with your idea that, you know, bringing uh, reusable water bottles into schools was a good idea? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, so you've got a ringing endorsement from, from the, the Science Museum then. That's good to hear. And, and he was actually in the award that I actually won. Oh, really? Oh, fantastic. Well, it sounds like you've got a lot of support for your petition uh, and a lot of important voices have backed you up. So I think um, that's really promising. Um, and now that you've been there and had that experience, do you think that this, is, this looks like you've got a really good basis to to do this, this, this project, to, to roll out these water bottles, do you think that's what you want to happen next? What would you like to see happen next? I would like Parliament to buy the bottles, please. OK. <coughs> well, we'll certainly, certainly, we'll certainly look into that. We'll see how much money we've got left in our wallet. And <laughs> well, thanks very much, Callum. And Alexander Stewart, you're going to ask some questions about how he's been handling the fundraising of all of this. Morning, Callum. My name's Alexander. You did a long walk to raise some funds to make sure you could buy uh, bottles for your school. Where did you walk and how long was it? So I started walking and in, in also the, for the last lockdown, February 2021, and, and it took 134 miles. I was actually just like on the back of Parliament, just on there. And, and, and how much did you raise? I raised £1,405.66. And Fantastic amount of money. And who, who went with you on the walk? So my mum and dad went with me and also my puppy and also my sister Matilda. And, and what did your school say when they, you'd raised that huge sum of money and you were able to give them a bottle? They said nothing. <laughs> but how did you feel? I felt very surprised that I'd raised so much money. It was actually over, over how much I had had to have. You, you beat your target? Yep. Excellent. And... Now that you've got that, uh, you want us to make sure that everybody uh, can now get the support and get a bottle? Yeah. And what's your, what's your next project going to be? Have you thought about that? Yeah. No. You want to get this one finished first? Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much for coming. And as I say, in raising a huge amount of money, Callum, you should be very proud uh, and very proud to be here today. We're delighted to see you. Yes, thank you, Alexander, and uh, thank you, Callum, uh, and I wish you lots of success going forward. Um, 
you are going to be seeing the First Minister shortly. So I wonder, colleagues, if we would agree on our next actions. First of all, is there anything else you'd like to say to us, Callum? Or, uh, no. you, you, good, great. Um, well, I think we've, we've actually got quite a clear steer, I think, in all of this. Uh, how many, out of just, with the money, how, how many bottles did that buy? Do you know how many it was? I, I earned so much money that I able to get some for the adults in the school too. Crikey. And I also bought some straws. Right. And, and, uh, and I gave some to every class of the rates in my school. The nursery, which is literally next door. And, and also some to the adults. And they have to share them. Okay, well, a lot of bottles. Well, before we... <laughs> sorry? 250. 250, well, that's fantastic. Well, before Hi. we just come to a conclusion, uh, our colleagues, Sue Weber, uh, I'm delighted to say, has been, as I said earlier, with us this morning. Sue, would you like to contribute to our thoughts and discussion? Oh, thank you very much, convener. And you can see why, when I first saw the Facebook posts from uh, Callum uh, back in May, not long after I got elected, you can see why... I was so keen to do everything I could to help this young, inspiring man, boy, to aspire to his dreams. And I followed him diligently, and he's, and he's walked the John Muir way. And we went out and met you and your puppy and your parents in East Lothian with my old dog. And your teachers, that's right. We had to see you as you got to the and end. And my of your auntie and walk. uncle. Oh, everyone was there. There was a lot of people. So, and I just think it's tremendous that you've opened up and been so willing to really endorse and support this young man's dreams and to get the First Minister involved again. I just think with everything else that we aspire to do as parliamentarians, I think when there's something as tangible as this that will make such a real difference to so many young people across the country, I think we would be foolhardy not to get on side with Callum and his petition and back it all the way. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, well, we know that uh, Callum colleagues is going to be meeting with the First Minister. Um, I wonder if the committee, in taking the petition forward and considering further Callum's evidence, if we would agree that we will write to the First Minister following the meeting just to outline again the objectives that Callum has set and to see what the First Minister and the Scottish Government might be able to do to take forward the objectives within Callum's petition. Can we agree on that? Agreed. We can. Uh, any other suggestions at this point? OK, we'll take things forward on that basis. Uh, Callum, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you in here. I hope you're going to have a great day going forward. We're going to take the petition forward. And after you've met with the First Minister, we'll be asking her to honour whatever commitments you can get out of her uh, and to see what we can do to put your petition into practice. So I'm going to suspend the meeting briefly and thank you very much. Thank you.
No, no, it's okay. Uh, welcome back, and uh, we once again to this fourth meeting of the Public Citizen Engagement Public Petitions Committee uh, of 2022, and we are now uh, resuming agenda item one, which is consideration of continuing petitions uh, with petitioners' evidence session. This is petition number 1812, protecting Scotland's remaining ancient, native, and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors. Uh, which has been lodged by Audrey Baird and Fiona Baker. And it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to deliver world-leading legislation, giving Scotland's remaining fragments of ancient, native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors full legal protection uh, before COP26, uh, which of course took place last November. So that deadline has passed, but uh, we're still very interested in the aims of this petition and the uh, issues at its heart. And at the last consideration uh, in February, we decided we would invite the petitioners uh, to hear from them directly. Uh, it's great that we are able to do that again, and so it's a very, very warm welcome uh, to both Audrey, Baker and, Audrey Baird and Fiona Baker. Uh, and following that, we are going to be hearing from a number of organisations who are interested in the issues that have been raised. Both of our petitioners uh, appearing today are here on behalf of Help Trees Help Us. And we also expect to be joined by Jackie Bailey, who uh, spoke to the petition uh, at its first consideration last month. She's on her way, and so we will uh, welcome Jackie in due course. So we have a number of questions and an opportunity just to test some of the objectives of the petition and what you might want and hope that we are able to do. So I can ask the petitioners first... Um, what they would specifically like, I think, to say to us at this stage uh, of our consideration by way of an introduction. And as one of you kind of nominated to sort of speak first, so Audrey Baird is going to speak first. Audrey Baird. Thank you very much. And I would like to return the thanks um, for uh, an extending an, an invitation um, to your committee today. It's, it's um, very much welcome. Thank you. I am going to be referring fairly ext extensively to notes because this is such a complex issue and um, you know, I, I don't come from a forestry background, so I do need some prompts. So in terms of an introduction, um, I, I would just like to say that uh, over the last two years since we submitted um, our petition, we feel that the case has been successfully made on an international stage, basically, you know, for uh, the world's old growth woodlands um, being protected to stem biodiversity decline, decline and global warming. Um, sadly, however, forest de deforestation of old growth woodland con continues unabated here in Scotland and across the world to meet growing demand for timber products from big economies like China and England. Uh, the tragedy is that most minds and hearts have not yet been won over by the case to save woods and trees for the future or for people who are losing their countries and uh, their homes and, and flooding and so on from uh, rising sea levels and indeed actually for the very survival of Earth's habitable ecosystem. Um, for our own local community, the ancient bluebell wood that gave rise to our petition two years ago is essentially our ground zero. And you have photographs of that uh, ancient bluebell wood before and after uh, a, blue, uh, a bike track was uh, built in it. Um, so in order to protect this wood, we feel that we need to identify the immediate threats to it. You can't protect it unless you know what the threats are. So that's basically the process that we're going, now, going through now. We're trying to identify what the threats within sort of a mile's radius of that wood are. So, so the key points I would really like you to try and keep, keep, keep in mind um, are Scotland only has 1% of its ancient woodland cover. That's down from 80% uh, land cover 5,000 years ago. England has about 3 to 4% of ancient woodland left. The term ancient woodland is not a legal term and does not bring any automatic legal um, protection. Um, most of uh, Scot Scotland's ancient woodland has no special designation like SSSSI and therefore no legal protection. So Nature Scott, in response to our initial petition, wrote, um, at present, more than half of Scotland's woodland with a special designation are in unfavourable con and declining condition and en route to eventual loss. The status of designated woodlands and their priority for innovation and incentives is important, but has not been sufficient so far to, pre to prevent the decline and loss described. The rate of decline and loss is very likely to be worse in those non-designated natural woodlands, which includes our, this, our, our own woodland. And again, you know, Heads of Planning Scotland, they wrote, um, specific nat national uh, legal protection for Scotland's remaining ancient native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors would be a long overdue start. 
With anything short of properly enforced statutory protection, these assets will remain at risk and continue to be degraded. So, in addition to that, and with regards specifically to the threats associated with commercial forestry, which is what seems to have brought us um, to this stage now um, with being invited here, um, around 16% of Scotland is already covered in monoculture commercial forestry. Some areas like Dumfries and Galloway are 25% afforested. And I suspect it's something similar for Argyll and Butte. Um, the vast majority is non-native and invasive, and half of all forestry is one single species, the high, highly invasive Sitka spruce. Sitka was blacklisted in Norway in 2012 and labelled as an ecosystem engineer by Norwegian soci scientists. Because, it, because of its ability to spread rapidly, it grows three times bigger than other nati native trees, and it changes the soil and water acidity to suit its own requirements. We understand that Scotland is already a net exporter of timber, so we already have enough meat uh, enough uh, to meet uh, our own population's needs and still sell some. Um, so when commercial forestry people basically slam the UK for having the second biggest deforestation footprint in the world after China, they're actually talking about England. The latest um, United Nations uh, International Panel on Climate Change report issued just last week includes a section on concerns about geoengineering. Specifically, it is most concerned about planting the wrong trees in the wrong place where they degrade water quality and soil and reduce biodiversity, indigenous plants and animals. Our, we feel that, that our local community in Argyll is powerless to stop the destruction of our immediate local environment. And you know, we, we have described that powerlessness in uh, our late, latest submission petition, uh, petition submission. Um, so thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I, just by way of an introductory question before uh, asking them, my colleagues to, to follow on. I mean, we did see the portfolio of photographs, and that was very striking. I mean, that was a, a series of images that we found quite arresting. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it is an extraordinary just how much stuff can just be dropped and uh, is very successful at invading a space and crowding out uh, stuff around about it. What do you... I mean, it, it, you may say it's all of these things, but... Is it primarily a lack of knowledge? Is it a lack of regulation? Or is it a lack of enforcement of what limited regulation there might currently be that you think has got us to where we are just now? Specifically, oh, sorry. I would say, I would say it's all three. Yeah. Um, I think the damage to the, to the Bluebell would... I think I don't think people set out to cause damage, and they weren't really aware of how much damage and, and destruction they were doing so easily to something that's so fragile. Um, the leg there is no legislation. When I mean, we spent, I don't know how many hours wading through guidelines and policies, and and the law. Um, you know, to try and find, because I had always grown up, we had always grown up under the impression that bluebells and ancient woodlands and wildflowers were all protected. And you didn't pick them and you didn't disturb them. So to find out when <clears throat> something was being damaged, what should we do to try and stop this and intervene? Actually, nothing. Um, so while we have an ancient woodland inventory and, um, you know, it's, de it's designated ancient woodland, it doesn't protect them. Um, so this is why we, we, we brought the petition, because legislation is needed to protect our ancient and semi-native and native woodlands and woodland floors. And, and out of interest, because I suppose, like you, I perhaps made assumptions about a regulatory or legislative environment that might exist. Why do you think we all thought that? Well, the Wildlife and Countryside Act um, does include provisions on uh, wildflowers and specifically bluebells. Um, and so I think people have kind of skimmed that perhaps and got an impression of what the legislation is. But in actual fact, if you read the de detail, uh, uh, bluebells, our native bluebells are only protected um, if you are not uh, digging them up, destroying them to sell them, and you don't have the landowner's permission. So the, it, the protection is against commercial harvesting yes. without permission to do so. Yes. But actually, commercial harvesting is also OK if you do have permission to do so. Is that, is that yes. the essence of it, yes, too? Yes, exactly. If you have the landowner's permission, you're, you can do that. Right. Now, that may have been appropriate in 1981 um, when this law was passed. Um, but here we are, what, 40-odd years later, and it's, it's not suitable anymore. 
you. Uh, David Torrance. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Audrey and Fiona, um, and welcome to your committee. You say in your submission that uh, you're looking for a protection of uh, historic native woodlands over 0.5 hectares, but is there a lack of data and information and collection that would help you achieve this, and how would that help um, the Scottish Government or whatever authority um, look after woods? Mm -hmm. OK, so this is in relation to the ancient woodland inventory that already exists. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can't protect something if you don't know where it is. Absolutely. And also, there's a terrible lack of knowledge in, in, in amongst community councils and, and local authorities that there is actually um, an, an, native, uh, an ancient woodland um, inventory. But the ancient woodland inventory that exists um, is completely out of date um, and it needs you know, substantial investment to bring it right up to date and make it rel relevant um, for current. And the inventory hasn't worked. It hasn't provided yeah. any protection. Um, and, you know, within just two miles in our local community over the last couple of years, in three different ownerships over less than a two-mile stretch, we've seen ancient woodland destroyed with the bike tracks, burnt, ancient oaks being burnt, um, and paws, which is planted ancient woodland, also which are, with a designation, illegally felled without any licence. And you think this is just within such a short stretch. Um, so to extrapolate that over the whole of Scotland, and of course, since we started this campaign, you know, we're hearing from all over Scotland of thing, things that are going on, and it's all incremental and adding up, and an inventory hasn't helped. It's great to have an inventory and to have it updated, but it's legislation that's, that we really feel is needed. Um, you, you mentioned the 1981 Act here, and it needs to be updated, but there's a new national... Uh, planning framework out just now for consultation. Have you been able to see it or have you fed into that so it could maybe change a regulation? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so, so getting the new national planning framework uh, for right uh, is absolutely essential for our ancient and native woodlands, yes. Um, all weak and ambiguous language um, has got to be removed um, to ensure that local authority planning officers have the law at their backs when they're actually recommending planning applications that threaten ancient and native woodland and other important nature sites are refused. Um, you know, it, it, all of the weaknesses are in the ambiguous language. So, and that makes, and that wastes time um, in committees um, and, it, and it causes a lot of stress for planning officers. It's, you know, give them the clarity that they need to actually make these recommendations and see them through so that they can actually protect our, our um, ancient woodlands and other sites. Um, so, uh, permitted de development rights for forestry plantations should be removed and also environmental impact assessments and the assessment of impact of forestry plantation on communities should be attached conditions to new planting schemes as a matter of course. So, um, yes, it, it, it is a, t a tremendous opportunity in the National Planning Framework for, and it mustn't be lost um, because we really are, uh, you know, if, if you listen to Antonio Guterres at the United Nations, we are running out of time um, and we just cannot afford to, to take these risks and have this sort of weak legislation that just creates loopholes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener, uh, and thank you, Audrey and Fina, for your comments so far and the knowledge that you have on the, on the subject is, is good to see, and, and thank you for imparting that uh, through some of the evidence you've given and also your statements. Now, we are aware that Scotland is due to have uh, an update on its biodiversity strategy. Uh, now, that, that could be a real benefit if it tackles what you're attempting and want to see uh, progressed. So what would you like to see in that strategy that would assist you uh, to achieve some of the goals that you're trying to impart in this process? Well, you know, we support the 2020 Nature Recovery Plan for Scotland, um, which is created by all the leading conservation organisations. You know, and these are, these are the real experts. Um, but, you know, having said that, relevant to our petition is, you know, the issues we have subsequently identified, there's the current 14,000 hectares per annum of forestry plantation by 2024. We really feel this needs to be reviewed very carefully and reconsidered. I mean, really, I think we just need, in terms of the afforestation programme, to stop, uh, to review it, to think about it, um, because I think we could be 
we feel that we could be heading for a you know a biodiversity catastrophe by you know it's um I'll, I'll continue to what I'd actually written down, is that you know, a Sitka spruce woodland is not a biodiverse woodland, and a native woodland is, broadleaf woodland. And a single statistic exemplifies this. The number of invertebrate species supported by a Sitka spruce is 37. The number supported by an oak tree is 423. And I think in terms of biodiversity, and the, the biodiversity and climate change are completely interlinked, it, it, it's a circle. And the carbon capture argument for commercial forestry, I also think we also feel it needs scrutiny because native broadleaf woodland will capture much more carbon over its lifetime than a 40 year cash crop. And all the carbon that is locked up in the soils and undisturbed in the so-called marginal land, you know, peat lands, even you know, I know it's less than 50 cent. If it's deeper than 50 centimetres, it can't be planted with conifer uh, plantations. But that top 50 centimetres captured plenty of carbon as well. And I think, you know, how much is being released, uh, how much carbon is being released by forestry? And actually, it's not a gain, it's a loss if we keep a forest in huge, uh, vast areas. We rather feel that the current forestation programme is a strangulation of Scotland's biodiversity and is potentially catastrophic in the long term. You know, reaching net zero is one thing, but doing it in a sustainable manner is another. And the other thing I'd written down, you know, one of Scotland's most famous sons and the founder of the Global National Parks Movement, John Muir, observed, when we try to pick out something by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And I think it would be important to remember that. And, and the, the whole idea of this... Uh... The, the, the commercial conifer plantations that, that come into the process uh, uh, and, and your views on how, how that should be balanced uh, in this whole system uh, uh, is, is really one of the main thrusts of your petition uh, because you, you want to try and identify and stop and stem some of that process to ensure that there's not. Uh, so your views on that would be quite useful as well. Well, it's, you know, from where we started... <laughs> You know, because we were upset about our bluebell wood being disturbed, and then you know trees are being burned, and 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 then at the same time, simultaneously, an application we're having another 202 hectares of commercial conifer planted uh, next door. So, as a community councillor and, and current convener of our community council, we were assessing that at the well as well. So we were going through the whole consultation. Uh, program, which I have to say leaves us at the end feeling completely disenfranchised and that the communities have no influence or seat at the table with the forestry industry and what is happening in our local environments for our health and well-being. That's why we sent in the, the pictures of the logging trucks, because this has been running for, you know, years. And this is more forestry, but we're going to keep using the same roads. But that is a separate, um, separate issue. Um, but yes, it, it is about balance, and I just feel, we just feel that with the current planting targets, and of course there are lots of other influences um, coming into there with commercial forestry and how much money is involved in it, which we might touch on, touch on later. But we just feel that we need to stop and assess and get a correct balance in this. We know how important commercial forestry is to Scotland, and we're not saying we shouldn't have commercial forestry. It just needs to be done better. Oh, thank, you. You like thank, you. thank you, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, our issue with commercial forestry in relation to ancient and native woodland is that, it, that commercial forestry species are invasive, invasive and non-native. Um, and uh, it's something that really has no profile in the media and elsewhere, that these are invasive, non-native species that are being planted in our country. Um, and uh, I mean, there, there are several sources of evidence um, in relation to this, but specifically uh, for Scotland, uh, this is the Forestry Commission Scotland's own guidance on managing invasive non-native forestry species that they produced in 2015. This is, that's the latest version of it. So that, it details how um, forestry managers should be managing um, in, in con conifer escape and self-seeding. Um, and you know, time is absolutely of the essence. You know, the, according to these guidelines and the UK forestry standard, they should be rapidly responding to um, spread, self-seeding spread from um, conifer plantations. But it also lists all of the species that they use uh, in uh, these commercial forests. 
Um, I mean, for, for, for Sitka spruce, for example, characteristics are so well known because of its widespread spread, spread, spread planting. Regeneration can be profuse in favourable conditions. Uh, early intervention would be needed. And here, um, Western hemlock, a species that is less used but potential to be highly invasive, particularly in native woodland, early intervention is needed. Now, I, I hope you got the impression from some of these photographs that I've sent you and that you saw um, at the last meeting from Jackie Bailey that many of those escaped conifers are many years old. You know, they are 10, 15 years old. Um, so so, so they're, they're not being um, dealt with by the, the forestry industry in the way that they should be according to the forestry standard. Um, in addition to that, um, as evidence, um, the Nature Scots, who I believe that you'll be talking to shortly, um, you know, they are already providing funding through their Nature Recovery Fund for the removal of self-seeded con uh, commercial conifers. So why is a publicly funded rest Nature Restoration Fund having to clean up, up after a very vastly wealthy, <laughs> um, highly profitable industry that's harming our country? Um, and the, the, also, you'll, I understand you'll be speaking to the, the um, RSPB again in their um, policy briefing, recent policy briefing. The threat of non-native commercial trees seeding out into peatlands and other priority wildlife habitats must be addressed when considering where to plant trees. This is already a significant issue and drain on conservation budgets and is likely to intens intensify in the future, risking Sc Scotland's world-leading um, peatland restoration uh, in investments. Um, you know, and, and in addition to that, obviously, there's all of the photographic evidence that um, we have provided, and um, you maybe ha had a chance to look at the Sky News piece also that was filmed in rainforest in Argyll, where, where the self-seeding of these commercial conifers, conifers in the rainforest and directly onto the trees themselves is very evident and obvious. <laughs> um, so, I, I, you know, th there is so much evidence out there that this is uh, an issue that is not being dealt with. And with, with one sixth of Scotland already covered in commercial forestry, and there clearly the industry is not able to manage um, that amount of forestry. Should we be adding more? Um, you know, when there's a big clean-up job that needs to be done already now. Thank you, Thank you so much. Ruth McGuire. My questions were actually around. Um, the impact of commercial <laughs> forestry, and we've covered it quite extensively. But I wonder if. Um, you know, we speak about the, the, the issues need to be addressed. Are you in a position to expand a bit more on what exactly needs to be happening and what the industry should be doing? Well, I, I, complying with the UK forestry standard, you know, complying with their own guidelines, it's all here. It's all perfectly clear in their own guidelines, um, but it's not happening. Yeah, well, I think... We feel that, you know, because um, with the targets of eight, currently 14,000, going up to 18,000 hectares a year, you know, there's a, I think there's a huge burden now on Scottish forestry to, to get all of these planting schemes approved and, and pushed on. And, you know, I kind of feel that they're not, maybe they're not all get, given the due, gel, due, due diligence that is required to look at all of the, the aspects of it. Um, so apart from greater buffer zones, be in better wildlife surveys, all of them having an environmental impact assessment. I mean, the one next to us, there is no uh, wildlife survey. They say, oh, there are no otters in these burns. Yes, there are otters in those burns. People have seen them. There are no whatever, I can't remember which kind of, it wasn't black grouse, but whatever kind of bird it was. But the RSBB people have seen, you know, little eared owls and what have you and up there. The archaeological survey, it looked pretty sketchy, you know, and it, We've already, you know, there's a 100% increase in just a tiny area from the local society going up and having a look around. So I don't know how, you know, I don't feel that they're particularly, I feel, I feel that things are getting pushed through in a rush and that there isn't due diligence. They should all, and there should be greater uh, intervention and possibility for communities to, to intervene. I did bring a picture with me. This is the local woodland that, um, that we're getting on our doorstep. So the top, you don't know if you see that, the top picture is what it looks like now, the bottom picture is what it's going to look like. And yet, we asked if we, we could have a community path through it. Nothing. They said, oh, we'll be looking into a new road, the landowners haven't heard anything, there's no new road. 
and all of this and so basically it's fiddling around the edges with putting a few broad leaves in to, to screen it and make it look a bit better but it's not enhancing biodiversity and I think I think Scottish forestry needs a bit of a, a root and branch review and I, we also feel I certainly feel that um, Scottish forestry and CONFOR are uh, in each other's pockets and who regulates the regulator you know who is they're marking their own homework that was a phrase that was used of the forestry commission in england and i think it is something to bear in bear in mind is who is scrutinizing the, you know the delivery of forestry thank you that's helpful thank you. Uh, paul sweeney thanks very much convener and thanks um thanks for coming along and, and, and making such a, a, an informative contribution so far um I looked at the, the photographic evidence that you submitted and <clears throat> was quite struck by example two in particular of the clearance of the um, ancient woodlands in Argyll, um, uh, pretty brutal looking uh, felling of trees. And you mentioned in this that um, having now investigated the felling works carried out, um, um, Scottish forestry are investigating, are pursuing a breach of the Forestry and Land Management Act, Scotland 2018. So I'd just like to understand what exactly in that act are the penalties for that kind of breach? Is there, is it, you know, often some of these penalties are so so utterly um, weak that infringements are just priced in, basically. And, you know, it's like people just take a bet on getting a parking fine. <laughs> you know, if, if they take the, the hit on 30 quid, they're not going to, you know, it's not going to massively change their behaviour. So I just wonder whether, um, in your view, what is the current provision for enforcement? And then when... The rules are enforced. What are the penalties? Um, I'd just be interested to know more about that. Okay. You want to? Well, the penalties are, are pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. I think for the felling, at the example that we've given you, I can't know how much. Five thousand pounds a tree. Five thousand pounds a tree, and there was a hundred yeah. cut. Yes. So half a million. Yeah. Was, would that have been was what there. the um, forestry officer told us at the time. Yes. However, um, the, there isn't. I think now. When is that? It's over a year. Mm -hmm. And we've just actually heard this week that there isn't going to be any enforcement. Um, and they've mm -hmm. had a nice chat and everything will be fine, don't worry. Is basically, what it, is basically what, it boi what it seems to boil down to. We'll be bringing um, more evidence on this, um, hopefully, in the, in the next sub submission. Uh, just talking about all of the issues that we're talking about with regards to commercial forestry and its threat and impact on... Can I ask who in this instance is the landowner? Who is the... the the, the person accused of, of... It's a private individual, the mm. landowner. Right. Yes. But yeah. Scottish Forestry came out, uh, their head of operations came out and, and looked colleague. at it and was, mm. at the time, you know, we, we, we were there and we helped, me, you know, measure the trees and uh, was very upset about it. You know, he was swearing at some of the trees that had been cut, cut down because it was so shocking. Um, so we're very surprised in, in trying to find out what was happening in, in the follow-up on it to find that, um, well, nothing. That, that there isn't being any enforcement. Well, there were so, various measures asked for, which was to fence the area of woodland that had been felled um, and put nets over the, over the stumps um, in order to protect them from uh, grazing animals so that they could naturally regenerate you know, in a kind of coppicing kind of way. Um, but the, the uh, landowner hasn't done any of these things. What was the landowner's motivation for felling the trees, do you know? They said because they wanted to have more grazing animals in there. They wanted to have more sheep grazing. And if you look at the... But it is, it is a planted ancient woodland. Um, the council were actually asked to put an emergency tree preservation order on it. We're still pursuing that. Um, though they have been up and looked at that. And the, ne the ancient woodland next door, which was getting burnt... Um, by the tenants on that land um, and that you know they said well yes these are high value woodlands so you know we're hopeful but again an emergency TPO and it's a year later so it's um, and, and a tree preservation order doesn't yeah I think they're broken all the time as well you know to be honest what's Sir Gail and Butte Council's position in relation to this have they expressed a view on T t t TPOs and enforcement of, of, of any of this? Well, I believe they have visited the woods, so th there may be a TPO on the way. Um, but we have, we were in contact with Nature Scott, SEPA, um, Scottish Forestry, and the Council on this um, particular incident. 
I mean, 23 square metres um, were felled, and you can fell up to five square metres without a licence. So anything over five square metres, you need a, a licence for. Right. Per quarter. I thought it was per annum. Well, well, okay. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we have, we have all of this in writing. We have all of this in writing <laughs> from the Scottish Forestry, and we are pursuing this at the moment, and hope to be able to come back to you with more information um, on this. Um, tree preservation orders are they something that a council can enforce? It's not a national thing, or can it no. be both? Um, no, it's 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 administered by the local authority. Right. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, a, a similar issue with the the Bluebell Wood example above. Um, I take it none of the landlord is at liberty to do what he likes with the landowner is at liberty to do with it, what he or she likes with that asset. It's not like you know a planning; they don't need a planning permission or something like that to do any changes. Do you feel that perhaps if you look at plan like planning consent as an example, would you say something more akin to that would be needed for for forestry and for woodlands if they were designated like listed buildings are designated, or is yes. that kind of what you're looking to achieve? Yes, yes. I mean our, our natural assets, our ancient woodlands, are not protected in the same way as our scheduled ancient mod monuments are at all. And yet we rely on them for life. <laughs> um, so yes, ultimately that would be, yes, great. So the kind of, a, a valid sort of comparator is how we treat our built heritage? Um, Actually, to... I would say uh, not some listed buildings obviously have protections, but scheduled ancient monuments have much more protection legal protection and shed and um, something akin to scheduled ancient monument would be uh, more appropriate for woodlands than listed buildings would you say this should be carried out on a, a, a national basis rather than being left to individual councils who may have radically different attitudes would you say that's important? i think it should be national it should be the law it should be scott's law is yes. our f f opinion <laughs> uh, and in terms of doing i mean when the listed building system was first brought in there was a national survey done of all potential candidates and then they were the, the list was compiled by kind of experts at the Royal Society for Ancient Historical Monuments in Scotland. You think something similar has to happen here? Would you also say there's a role for public nominations of potential sites? That's a good idea. The more you can involve um, communities in identifying their ancient woodlands, the better, um, because they don't know where they are. It's, it's so very difficult to um, know what the character, characteristics of a, an ancient woodland are. Um, so, yeah, good idea. Because we're also looking, you know, that we feel this inventory and register should include um, native and semi-native self-generated woodlands. Yes, and I think uh, some, and because our ancient woodlands have become so fragmented, some of the just tiny pockets that um, are still worth protecting and trying to preserve and regenerate, um, you know, because we would hope that any kind of register would also be considering the regeneration of these woodlands. Because in, ter in, and in terms of carbon capture, they're our best bet for the future, not um, a, a short-life conifer cash crop. Just to go back to, so if I'm hogging time, but it's just convenient, but, um, but just another point about um, conifer contamination. Mm -hmm. Is there any provision in law to deal with that or address it? Um, is it, is it not treated in the same way as, as other sort of, you know, contaminations? Well, it, it is UK forestry standard. In order to meet the UK forestry standard, right. you should be dealing with any invasive spread, self-seeding, yes. There's no enforcement against that? There Doesn't is. Like an old, the, the, the law is that um, any, any invasive species, if you allow an invasive species or a non-native to spread or grow outside of its own, that is against the law, but the forestry industry is exempt. So the law exists, but not but forestry is exempt. Okay. Um, well, that's really helpful. I just needed to get it clearer in my head. I hope, I hope you. Uh, thank you for indulging me, convener. <laughs> but uh, I think the key thing for me is it's about lack of enforcement. I, I mean, I was, I was concerned that you mentioned for, for Scottish forestry were initially gung ho about enforcement of this case, and then seemed to have had a gen gentleman's agreement to to let it lie, which is a bit problematic. And then there's also this issue about how do we enforce a, a more robust measures such as like we do with ancient monuments. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that helps to clear it up for me. I don't know about the rest of the committee. You know, that, was, uh, that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I just touch on something that I noted in, in your most recent uh, submission, um, which is relation to, because we've talked here quite a bit about the uh, commercial forestry and 
aspects and issues are rising from that. But you touch on um, mountain biking. And I'm not a mountain biker, I should say. Those, those days are behind me. But as it happens, I, I do do quite a lot of walking uh, in the Alps and the continent. And I've seen a fairly massive expansion of this as a pastime. And very interestingly to me, uh, in France and Switzerland and wherever else, there are an awful lot of Scottish families, I'm aware, uh, are participating because the, you, you're suddenly struck by the accents and there's a very strong Scottish thread through it. And um, it's interesting for those of us who are walking in the Alps or wherever going down uh, to see the various biking trails that have been put in place. Um, which tend to be designed to get from the top to the bottom in the fastest possible time. I mean, it, 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 they're not stopping for a picnic halfway down or anything. I mean, they, they, they are getting where they have to get to. And it, clearly that is an emerging, growing sport. And the thrill of it, I think, is it's not through open country, but it is through forested. The whole thing is the cuts and turns of doing it. How do you see, I mean, given that, that appears to be an emerging and growing and popular sport for which there could be an ever-increasing demand. How do you see something like that being accommodated? Because it'll have to be accommodated if it's popular, but how do you see something like that being accommodated uh, within the landscape that we have and where you think that's appropriate and where you think it would be better not to be facilitated and whether it needs to be managed in some way rather than just uh, produced on a whim. Yes, um, There's no doubt about it. Mountain biking is really popular um, in Highlands Wood, which is the conifer woodland uh, close to us. There are many mountain bike trails um, which have been set up by the local mountain bike group uh, with the forestry company's permission. So, absolutely, it's, it, could, it could be managed. It needs to be managed. And, you know, to go back to archaeology and, and cultural heritage, there are mitigation. You know, any, if you read any set of planning conditions, there are ways to mitigate everything. One of the other points, when we looked into the mountain, you know, the mountain bike trail in the Bluebell Wood, which was just being built, and I can't remember if it was the Mountain Bike Council of Scotland or what the organisation was called, but they had quite a lot of guidance about building mountain bike trails, how to do it safely, things not to do. There were a lot of things with that trail which would be considered dangerous, that would not be done on a professionally built trail, and the landowner was, ac was actually... If they'd fallen and broken their necks, the landowner would have been liable. So there is actually... you know, it's, It is a pretty developed sport um, and activity, so th there's... There are ways to manage it, and I think in terms, it's like building a hydro scheme or a wind farm, or as forestry should be, is you avoid your acid flushes, you avoid your archaeological monuments, you avoid your ancient trees, and so yes, it, it needs to be it needs to be managed. And I actually think that the mountain biking council, if that, I can't remember exactly what they're called, but I think that they would probably welcome uh, actual government assistance in you know, creating standards for that. I mean, it is an Olympic sport too. It's, um, so yes, I just think it, it can be done in a managed way. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's fa I'll come back to just to Paul just in a minute. I mean, it's a fascinating thing to, to watch. Uh, I have to, I mean, I have to be honest and say that I don't go up, I walk down the mountains, not up. So I tend to be going up in a chairlift or a cable car, which allows you to look down and all the people that are doing the biking. And there's a lot of reinforced body armour now associated with it because you, they do expect to be thrown off their bikes at various points. Um, but, but as I say, as you say, it's Olympic sport, but I can see it, it is very much one that is growing and for which there'll be increasing demand. And that's an interesting observation um, about their own um, operating authority, which may be something we want to pursue. Paul, Sweeney, you wanted to come back in just briefly because we are coming just to the end of our time. Yes, Convito, just a brief one, just to emphasise this point about there is a seeming grey area. If you take Cathkin Park's BMX trail, for example, that was done as a result of planning permission for the Commonwealth Games, right? But I'm just, I'm just astounded that such a development doesn't require planning consent. Um, and that, you know, you know, if you developed a ski slope in Glenshee, for example, you know, you would require planning consent to do it. I just think there's something in this to be further investigated about where do you draw the line? Why aren't councils 
you know, looking at that as well, maybe not in the legislation, maybe there is a gap, um, but also as an issue around enforcing where people are just doing stuff without seeking planning permission. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Audrey Baird. Just very briefly to say that if it's deemed as a dirt track where there are no additional materials brought into the wood, um, then it doesn't need any planning permi permission. So they, so they basically used the fallen timber and unfortunately the stone dike that was, had originally protected the wood um, as materials to create the bike track. Um, and that, that was not illegal, given, the, given that the landowner had given permission for this. Okay, as we come to the end of this, I just wanted to give you, but is there anything we've not touched on that you would, uh, obviously we're going to go into this round table shortly, uh, for which I know you're going to uh, stay in the gallery to, to observe, but is there anything you'd just like to add finally to our thinking? Very, very briefly, um, can I just make a couple of points? So estate agents um, uh, are mar marketing Scotland's marginal land um, as if it is in some way less you know, than productive land. But this marginal land that they uh, uh, advertise for tree planting is actually essential for biodiversity, wildlife, tourism, walking, biking, and simply appreciating our beautiful country. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been reminded once again how important it is for local people to value their country and obliterating it with monoculture evergreens and taking away all its colour, character, beauty. And beauty is doing absolutely nothing for Scotland. Um, and a conifer, uh, sorry, CONFOR undertook a survey of attitudes to commercial forestry in the Highlands in the last couple of months and reported that nine out of, out of ten respondents were very favourable towards additional um, afforestation. But did they explain to those people um, the risks associated um, with uh, commercial forestry, the invasiveness and the fact it's non-native and so on? I very much doubt it. Um, and um, just respectfully, I, I wondered, given ha hearts and minds still have to be won over, you know, a sort of earth first, earth first type campaign, um, you know, is urgently needed to persuade old, uh, to persuade all people that old growth, woodland, and other important nature resources are essential, you know, for life on earth now. And do you want to finish with? Um, I think something else that we haven't actually really touched on is about. Um, Audrey's just mentioned Strutt and Parker, and the price of marginal land has increased by over £3,000 per acre from, say, two two 2500 to 5500 in the last year, um, which is all to do with the, the rush for forestry, and it's a get-rich-quick scheme, as we know, with Gresham House and all the stuff with the Scottish National Investment Bank, just that Jackie represented on. You know, and agricultural communities are starting to be priced out and disenfranchised. And there's already, this is already hitting the headlines in Wales. And I, it's been described by farming communities in Scotland as it may lead to another highland clearance. So again, that's part of the overall, as I said, you know, there's just more and more and more issues around it. Um, and I just think mistakes are being made and we need to stop and review and understand the real impacts of the massive expansion of monoculture forestry on the climate emergency, health, well-being, economy, biodiversity, and maybe, you know, very important to all of us, the patrimony of our nation. Uh, thank you both very much. Uh, I know it was a very early start for you. Uh, I hope you can see that as a committee, I think we're very interested in your petition. I think it has opened up a number of areas that it would be very worthwhile for us to pursue and examine in some detail further, which, of course, will begin with the, uh, your evidence this morning and, and now the roundtable that we're going to hear from. So I'd like to thank you both very much, uh, and we will obviously take the petition and the discussion further forward and liaise with you further as we do. So thank you very much. And I'm going to just suspend again briefly. Thank you.
So welcome back uh, as we resume this uh, meeting of the Citizens Engagement and Public Petitions Committee and our consideration of the petition in relation to Scotland's remaining ancient native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors. We heard just a few moments ago from the petitioners, Audrey Baird and Fiona Baker, and I'm delighted now to support a roundtable discussion uh, to welcome a number of people who are going to be able to help us in our deliberations. So good morning to Andrew Wetherill from the RSPB, from Arena Russell. Uh, good morning to you from the Woodlands Trust, from Doug Howison, uh, who is with us at the end of the table from Scottish Forestry. And joining us online this morning, uh, we have uh, virtually Claudia Rose from Nature Scott and also Andy Leach from Confor. So welcome to both of you as well. Hopefully everybody can see them on the screens, although... Uh, if you're at the far end of the table, it's quite a reach just to see, to see the screen, but hopefully you can. Um, we had hoped to be joined by our colleague Jackie Bailey, but she is sitting in another committee just now and unable to get here at this point. And this is the first roundtable discussion we've held as a committee in this new session of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, it would all have been virtual until now, so it's great to actually be able to have uh, you with us. If you'd like to contribute as we go through the discussion on any of the issues, rather than going round everybody every time, you can just either catch my eye or the eye of one of the clerks, and that will, they will then let me know that you'd like to come in on that uh, particular point. And if you are what if you're participating to our two colleagues who are participating on uh, virtually this morning, if you just put R in the chat box, the clerks are looking out for that, and again they'll intimate to me that you would very much like to join us in the discussion. Uh, those of you who are here, your mics all work remotely, so you don't need to press buttons or anything. They will be being controlled by our team as well, so you don't need to get preoccupied about that. And I'll move to our first question. And We, we, we actually have just heard from our petitioners um, about the value of ancient native woodlands and whether or not adequate protections are in place, as we see a big expansion of commercial forestry and also other potential uses of ancient woodland uh, for recreational use. And I wonder what your reaction is in general terms to the, uh, to the essence of the petition, and at the same time, your own respective views, and on this occasion I possibly will go around everybody, but your own respective views on the biodiversity and the value of that ancient and native and uh, semi-native woodland to Scotland, why it's important, and why also the woodland floor supporting it is, is important too. Uh, so by way of an introduction, I shall maybe go to each in turn. So would somebody like to volunteer to, or will I just take the, I'll just go to Andrew Weatherall and take the, take the, the, the lead, Andrew. Okay, uh, thank you, convener. Um, I think uh, there's quite a few bits to that question. So the value of the petition, first of all, I think is, um, it's really timely and important, so I would like to thank uh, Fiona and Audrey for that. Um, I was personally quite shocked to, to read in the Woodland um, Trust's excellent report on the state of the UK's woods and forests last year that in Scotland, um, 270 woodlands since 1999 have been lost to or damaged by development, and I did, had no idea that it was so... Uh, such a large number and also really disappointed to see that of those that had been threatened by development actually 72 or 73 percent of those had then been lost and in contrast to the other devolved nations of the UK that's a much worse position the the proportion lost across the UK is 40 45 percent I think so clearly the desire to protect ancient woodlands and there are lots of references to that in, in government literature is not quite working at the moment and then I think I just want to say about the biodiversity value of the um, ancient woodlands there is uh, you know lots I think it's in the uh, Scot Scotland's forestry st strategy the mention of the value of ancient woods and I've just been reading a paper from last year by Eliza Fuentes Montemayor and others about the structural value, the special structural value that aids the biodiversity of ancient woodlands. And they're suggesting that new woodlands don't begin to take those characteristics on for 80 to 160 years after they've been planted. So from the point of view of addressing the climate and the nature emergency, 
I think those ancient woodlands are a precious resource that we do need to address the protection of. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Irina? Thank you for the question. And first and foremost, I want to thank um, Audrey and Fiona Baker um, for the petition and the opportunity to discuss this um, at Scottish Parliament today. Fiona and Audrey are just ordinary members of the public that are very determined and very, very passionate. Um, and the Woodland Trust is really grateful to them for their passion and determination um, and continued dedication to ancient woodland protection and to bring this matter to the Parliament today. Um, we, as a native, uh, as a leading native woodland conservation charity in Scotland and um, in the UK, uh, believe that protections for ancient woodland um, are not sufficient at the moment. We know their condition um, is unfavourable uh, in some cases, and we also know that planning policy is not watertight enough to give our ancient woodlands the protection uh, they rightly deserve. They, these are extremely biodiverse habitats. Our forestry strategy for Scotland recognises these habitats um, as the ones that will contribute most to biodiversity. Um, and to put it quite simply, they are irreplaceable. So once they're gone, they're gone. They cover less than 2% of our land area. We should be able uh, to protect them better than we do um, at the moment. They also have cultural value in Scotland. Um, and like Scotland's rainforest or a Caledonian pine wood, Scotland's rainforest has species that are not found anywhere else in the world. We really owe it to the world to protect these um, species and this precious habitat. They're also important carbon stores because they've been in existence for so many centuries. Um, our ancient woods actually have been shown to hold 30% more carbon than the average for other woodland types. So there's beyond the biodiversity value, there's also the cultural and carbon value that we should take into account when we look at policies uh, for ancient woodland and also for forestry in, in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll bring in the first of our, our virtual contributors, if I may now, uh, and that is Claudia Rose from Nature Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you very much uh, for joining this event. Uh, and as others have said, I think, yes, we really welcome the petition coming forward. And it is really timely as we look towards developing a new biodiversity strategy for Scotland and how we can halt biodiversity loss in the next 10 years and restore it by 2045. I think others have said about um, uh, the important value of ancient woodlands for um, biodiversity, and I would completely echo that. They're some of Scotland's most valuable woodlands, and they support a range of species of flora and fauna, whether that's in our Atlantic rainforests, as Arena has mentioned, or the upland oakwoods and ashwoods and birchwoods um, that are important. So, um, uh, yeah, and uh, oh, the other point you said about the structural diversity, I think that's really important point. And certainly um, we already recognize that importance um, in our site condition monitoring process, which actually monitors how that structural diversity uh, is an important component of a functioning woodland. I think just one point as well to flag up that others haven't said, um, at the moment, 25% of Scotland's natural woodland area is currently protected through existing nature conservation designations. So um, that's a significant proportion. And with um, Scottish Government's commitment to protecting 30% um, of biodiversity by 2030, um, we're actually in a, in a reasonable position on um, protection of natural woodland at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Doug Howison, I'd like to bring you in, Steve. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, I have some data here from the Native Woodland Survey of Scotland uh, in 2014. And in that uh, survey, it was uh, recognised that there are 311,000 hectares of native woodland in Scotland that's 22.5 per cent of the total woodland area. Um, 120,000 hectares of woodland are present on ancient woodland sites, of which 65 per cent 
were native, and some of that is now Paws, Woodland, and so on. As a forester, what, what I would say is that um, our ancients and native woodlands are some of, our, some of our most treasured and beautiful woodlands in Scotland. And they're iconic in their setting, and they are just fantastic places to spend time in. And as foresters, we would um, regret any further decline in the ancient woodland resource in Scotland because it's so valuable and such a wonderful resource. Um, for us, the two biggest elements that are uh, the endangered ancient woodlands are invasive non-native species and, and herbivore damage, principally by deer. And so we have a we have a resource. Uh, we're not going to get any more of it that's that's of that status for eighty to hundred years. But in the last four years, we have granted a decreation of fifteen thousand hectares of new native woodland, uh, and we spend between a million and a million and a half pounds each year on the restoration, protection, enhancement of Scotland's exi existing native woodlands. Thank you. Thank you very much. From Scottish forestry to CONFOR and our second virtual participant this morning, good morning Andy Leach and very happy to welcome you to the, to the round table and to ask you to make a few introductory comments. Uh, thank you for in inviting me along. Um, I think Doug had my script there because <laughs> he's just given you all the, the kind of facts that I was going to, to share with you too. Um, in regard, as far as Confor is concerned, um, ancient woodland is, is a, a key resource for Scotland. Um, every, the other speakers have, have mentioned about key habitat, structure, etc. So I'll, I'll not repeat it. I think what Scottish government should be proud of is too is, is their, their woodland creation targets of eighteen thousand hectares per annum, and, and of course forty percent of that at least is going to be native woodland. So whilst it's not Increasing the, the level of ancient woodland because of, because of the age situation, um, it is certainly increasing native woodland. But I don't want to repeat what everyone said. We, we totally uh, agree with the, the biodiversity, biodiversity value, structural value of the ancient woodlands. Thank you. David Torrance, do you want to lead us into a, an area of discussion? Thank you, Convener, and good morning to all the panel members. Um, the Woodlands Trust has campaigned for years for protection of ancient woodlands. Um, has any progress been made on the commitments by the Scottish Government? Will they offer greater protection? I guess that's a question for me yes, directly. I guess so. Um, so, yes, we've been, the roots of our organisation um, are in protecting um, ancient woodlands. That's, that's what we were founded to, to do. Um, there has been progress. Um, but that progress, the one that's most obvious is possibly in, in England um, at the moment through increased protections for, through, for planning policy in England, through the national planning policy framework. Um, and there's also the ancient woodland um, inventory in England, um, which is a, a map resource for the extent of, of ancient woodland um, in England is also underway. Uh, so sorry, the, the update of that is underway. So they're mapping um, habitats and updating that inventory at the moment. There are issues, however, with uh, while planning protections in England um, have um, improved, our experience at the moment is that we're seeing less direct impacts um, on um, from, from inappropriate development, but we're seeing more indirect impacts. So next to ancient woodlands rather than directly on ancient woodlands, we're seeing developments that are causing decline um, in these woods. And we are at the moment conducting a review of the last three years of evidence on planning applications uh, that have affected ancient woodlands UK wide. Um, and we can share further data with um, also with government and with uh, the committee if that was uh, needed, but that will be available um, sometime in due course. I don't have data, um, the, the exact dates for that. Um, and your second part of the question was... Was if, um, commitments by Scottish Government, um, will that offer greater protection to ancient woodlands? So Scottish Government's made commitments to protect and restore Scotland's rainforest. Uh, that's been really, really welcome. Um, they've also made commitments that 30% of land will be protected by 2030. Um, there's 
commitments to um, restore our riparian woodlands, for example, and also our national planning framework, the current draft that is actually for scrutiny of the local government um, committee, does have improved protections. That's a draft document at the moment. We really do hope that the wording stays as it is, or it could be slightly improved. There's a should there that could become a must, uh, just to make the policy as watertight as possible. Um, but if that um, national planning uh, framework policy um, is approved and it comes out in the final version, we will be in a better uh, place for uh, protection from development, though. Um, there's also... As um, my colleague Doug Howison mentioned, the biggest threats to our ancient woodland are actually overgrazing, mostly by deer and also invasive non-native species, particularly rhododendron ponticum. We, there is at the moment no overarching strategy or no overarching aim um, and clear direction to address these issues. There are commitments, there's ongoing dialogue that we are having with, with government on these issues, but um, given that we are in a nature and climate emergency, we would like to see more action um, on the ground now um, to, uh, as an accompaniment to all these um, commitments, which we welcome, but we just need to kind of get on with it at this point in time. My next question was around NPF4, and you says there could be improvements made to it to protect the woodlands. What improvements could these be? Um, so um, the particular policy that deals with um, Antrim woodland um, and also with broadly, broadly with, uh, with all native woods in Scotland, it's policy 34. And at 34B, there's a word that um, planning applications or development um, should, should not be supported if it causes damage to ancient woodland, including indirect damage. So it is much better. The wording is much clearer than what it used to be. Um, and it will go we think, if implemented correctly, will go a long way to improve the situation at the moment. But if that should could become a must, um, it would be ideal and it would actually speak to you know, the aim of trying to have no further loss of ancient woodland. That's what we would really like to see reflected in, in policy. These habitats, like I say, they're irreplaceable and they cover 2%. I don't think that we need to continue doing development and our planning policy should not be at the cost of, um, of these precious habitats. It's also about how you implement the policy. As we see in England, the wording is improved, but we are aware of cases where it's not been implemented as well as it can be, and it ties in with, we need to have expertise um, in tree and biodiversity officers within planning departments at local authorities. So that will be key to implementing uh, the policy. Uh, it's all good having the policy wording. It's just as good as it impl its implementation, really. And then also data in Scotland, we have only a provisional ancient woodland inventory, so we don't really know the extent, the full extent of ancient woodland. So how can you protect what you don't know um, is, is there, really? Um, so planning policy is better, to sum up, but it's about how we implement it, and we need more data to be able to know, to know where this is so we can look after it. Thanks. Well, sweetie, you were keen to come in. Yeah, um, I just wanted to... Just kind of clarify. Um, obviously, there was a kind of consensus emerged at this opening remarks about you know the importance of, of ancient woodland in Scotland. And I just wanted to, to direct this point to, to Nature Scot Scottish Forestry Confer, just purely for the record that you your organisations respect uh, respectively agree that the current protection regime is insufficient. I just wanted to just absolutely get that established explicitly. Um, if you could each agree or disagree. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Doug Howison. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, convener, did you want to speak? No, no, I just, I'm sorry, I'm letting people know who it is that is speaking, because <laughs> it could look like a confusion of voices. It's not always clear. Uh, thank you, convener. Yes, so in terms of Scotland's forestry strategy, we're about to launch the second implementation plan. And one of the aspects of that is to work more closely with delivery partners including Nature Scott and other parts of Scottish Government, for the implementation of the plan as that relates to ancient woodland, for example. And we're currently thinking about how can we pull the resources together to do the best that we can, specifically on deer management, um, because it's an existential threat to native woodland and ancient woodland is the impact of herbivore damage. So just last week we were talking in a meeting with Nature Scott about how do we combine the forces to do the best that we can for the ancient woodlands. 
and I think we made some really good progress on that meeting. I think there's a recognition that um, the, you, this, the whole is greater than some of its parts on this, and to try and do things separately, we could do better if we worked together. And so we're looking to establish a series of project areas, um, for example, ancient woodlands, and to pull the resources to do the best that we can there. So I think that's moved forward from where it was. Uh, well, I, I'm going to just, you wanted to ask Andy Leach the same question, I think. Well, yeah, you? I mean, it was just... just in the be, first instance, so I come yeah. to Andy, then to Claudia, then to Andrew, then back to you, Paul, possibly, and then Andrew. Uh, so, uh, Andy first. Yeah, Paul, can you just repeat the specific question again? Well, it was just, do you agree that the current protections are inadequate? And that's the petition, the nub of the petitioner's issue, is the current protections aren't inadequate. Do you, your organisations agree that that's the case? Uh, yes, um, in that, as has been stated before, the, the key threats are herbivores and um, rhododendrons, etc. I suppose where I'd be coming from is I agree with you, but we'd also have to consider what are the measures we would take to, to protect them, and then we'd have to consider what the impacts of those are in other, other areas as well. But, so I agree with you in principle, but the kind of um, Devil would be in the detail on how we would address this. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's really helpful. And Claudia Rose is keen to join at this point. Claudia. Um, thank you. I, I mean, I suppose the crux of it depends what you mean by um, further protections and whether current protections are insufficient. The, as I said, about twenty-five percent. It's a bit under from the figures um, that uh, Scottish Forestry quoted uh, are already under formal protection and um, government have got a plan to further increase protection of biodiversity to 30 per cent in the next 10 years. So it is about, but the impacts on the condition are what is important. And I think that's what we recognise 49 per cent of Scotland's natural woodlands are in poor condition. So it is not necessarily about further protections, but it is about both policy and, and then implementing the policy. And I think that's what we've been talking about. And just to touch on um, the deer issue, issue um, there is a coherent strategy to address um, deer impacts more coherently. The Independent Deer Working Group reported to Scottish Government, and um, there is now a planned new deer legislation in this next parliamentary programme to implement its findings. And a new programme board has been set up, again, um, as um, uh, Doug Howison was saying, on the forestry strategy side, to have a collaborative and collective approach to managing deer impacts, particularly to secure woodland restoration and its biodiversity value. So I think that's uh, an important element going forward. Thank you. Paul, are you happy with that particular point there? Very helpful. Yeah, absolutely convenient. Um, Can I come back to you in a moment then? Certainly. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think, Andrew, you were actually, Andrew, whether you were going to follow up on, on what Arena had originally said before we moved to that. So if I can come to you first. Yeah, thank, thank you, convener. I'll try and tie the two threads together. So, first of all, I was going to talk about uh, NPF4 and just say within that the RSPB is um, calling for greater protection, a Scottish nature network, so that we can also identify through NPF4 uh, where there are opportunities for targeted na natural woodland extension, colonisation, perhaps some planting, because we, it's really important to Remember, I think, that we are in a nature and climate emergency. The, um, the work done uh, last year showed that the uh, bio biodiversity intactness within Scotland was about 56%. I think the uh, Woodland Trust's work has shown that most ancient woodlands are uh, smaller than, than five hectares. We're talking about isolated, very vulnerable f fragments. It's not just the protection with climate change, pests and diseases, we have to go further and it has to be about enhancement, improvement, expansion as well as a whole package of protection. And that includes uh, 
the restoration of plantations on ancient woodland sites. If our ancient semi-natural woodlands are our best woodlands, then the plantations on ancient woodland sites have the potential, when restored, uh, to be part of that, that resource again. Uh, in Wales, I know that they use a mapping categorisation called Restoration of Ancient Woodland Sites, another acronym, I'm afraid, ROARS, but it really enables them to map their success in converting or restoring back towards that ancient semi-natural woodland status, which is the sort of best value of ancient woodlands that we've got. So uh, my answer is, you know, clearly... When you look at the figures, woodlands are still being lost and damaged by development. We know that deer and rhododendron are, are, are problems as well. So protection is not just enough to say we've protected them and that's it because they will be impacted by things. So it's got to be protect, improve, expand, which I think is something that Doug would recognise as something Scottish forestry would talk about. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Can I ask a question, Convener, specifically of Claudia uh, in, in Nature Scott? Because, Claudia, in some of the submissions that we've had, uh, there has been, uh, it's been raised that there's a lack of resources at Nature Scott. Uh, and that's having an impact uh, and is a barrier uh, to protecting uh, ancient woodlands. Now, that could be through surveys or, or monitoring or managing or updating inventories. Uh, and also in planning applications. Uh, so is that an issue that Nature Scott would recognise? And if it does recognise that, how should that be addressed? Claudia? Um, thank you very much. I mean, Nature Scott's overall resources have declined over the last 10 years um, uh, uh, with government pressures and challenges and um, priorities, and I'm sure the committee are aware of that already. But having said that, we have, um, you know, just negotiated our budget and resources for next year, and absolutely the emphasis is on supporting governments, um, the programme for government and the priorities set out. And woodland restoration, biodiversity restoration, Deer management and some of these issues you've set you've mentioned are, are clearly where we will provide the resources that we can. Um, funding will always be a constraint that we can't take action everywhere we might like to. So, for example, looking at some of the woodland areas, um, looking at where we want to prioritise deer management, we will need to look at priority areas about you know where we can have the greatest impacts most quickly to restore biodiversity by 2030 and i think it's important not to forget that longer term target that it is to restore nature biodiversity by 2045 so there is further time as we work through uh, future budgets to look at how those resources are allocated but um that is uh, the world we live in I hope that gives you an indication of where we are. Thank you. Uh, you, you uh, thank you, Claudia. You acknowledge, you acknowledge the issue uh, is a concern, uh, and you've in indicated that you have to deal with priorities to ensure that that is the case. But in doing that, uh, there must be, at times, a frustration by your organisation that you're not able to, uh, are un, are, are, because of financial restraints, you're unable to progress to the level that you'd like to achieve. Uh, and the submissions uh, that we've received uh, only enforce that. Claudia. Can I come back on that yes, point, Convena? Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one of the additional points I would say is that it's not only our resources or even public, um, uh, other public money through uh, Scottish forestry that's the essential element. Most woodlands in Scotland are privately owned and it is going to be, um, you know, an imperative sort of partner in taking forward what we've set out here, what's set out here in this petition, petition and improving um, biodiversity outcomes in ancient and semi-natural woodland is for landowners, people who live and work in off the land to also come forward 
and to work with them. So it's not only going to be our resources, it's also about the landowners and land managers and community and bringing them with us. I've got an indication from both Ruth and uh, Paul Sweeney that they'd like to come in. Ruth McGuire. Um, thank you, convener. Um, and I've, I've heard everyone this morning say that um, deer management and invasive um, plants, for example, rhododendron, are, are, are the greatest threats. However, the, the, the petition in front of us this morning speaks, um, or we spoke a lot this morning, about the encroachment of commercial um, plantation tree species into ancient and native woodlands. So I'd like to hear a bit of um, the panel's opinions on that. Um, I suppose the first question would be for, for um, specifically for Doug for Forestry Scotland. Um, what exactly do you do to prevent that happening? Um, and how are you tackling it in terms of new plantations as well? And your opinions on the opportunities to address it through the update of the UK forestry standard? OK, thank you. Um, there was a few questions there. Uh, thank you. So, first of all, generally, there are some localised areas where um, seeding in of commercial species does occur. We don't normally see that in all of our ancient woodlands of Scotland because of the fragmented nature and the location of those. Um, so, that's the first thing, although we do recognise that in some areas it is an issue. As part of the forestry grant scheme, we have something called a Woodland Improvement Grant. And a Woodland Improvement Grant does a, does a number of things. Part of that is habitat and species uh, management improvement, and that provides specific capital grant funding for the cost of removing conifer trees and unwanted uh, species from within Asian woodland. So we'll provide a grant for that, and this year the total grant is £1.8 million. So I think we have that covered. We don't see generally um, the call on that grant is for two things. It's for fences to exclude deer and secondly for the exclusion of rhododendron ponticum, invasive non-native species. Generally, we don't see a lot. Sorry. It, just to clarify, and that, that goes to, to that grant's available to landowners to improve their... And how is that publicised? That that's the availability of that? Uh, well, we have uh, the on Scottish Forest website, and um, we have uh, access to all the information about the grants, um, and we uh, have five conservancies in, in Scotland and uh, series of wound officers who deal with customers and clients and inquiries on a regular basis. Thank you. Sorry I interrupted you. That's fine, thank you. <laughs> um, so the vast majority of that spend um, is on deer management through deer fencing, uh, and removal of rhododendron. It's a capital grant uh, on rhododendron, so the biggest problem for us is that people take the grant to clear the rhododendron, but because it's invasive, it regrows. Um, and we probably need to think about a future grant scheme to ensure we provide some funding for the management of regrowth, not just the cutting in the first place. So that was those two. UK forestry standard is a technical standard uh, over the four administrations in the United Kingdom. It's being reviewed currently, um, and the latest version is due for release by December this year. And by far the biggest issue in that is the percentage of um, native trees we're allowing in, in, in any other scheme. So, for example, if someone wanted to plant conifers, we always insist that at least 25% is made up of native tree species other more diverse conifers and open space. And the biggest issue about the UKFS is, is th are those proportions right? And should we reduce the element of a single species? And we have to balance that between sustainable economic growth in forestry and forestry contributes at least one billion gross value added to Scottish Scotland's economy. So there's kind of balance that's required in that discussion. So I don't see the UKFS as the principal mechanism for resolving um, the impact on ancient woodlands. It's Scottish forestry strategy, the implementation plan, and working with delivery partners that will do that for us. I suppose the question that, that comes to mind is, is why would, um, and I, I, don't, I probably do know the answer to this, but why would a landowner not wish to implement that best practice and what can we do to in, in, encourage them? Um, I, I was surprised to hear that um, a bit of community woodland was refused. 
I mean, can, can we address that through stronger planning in terms of community benefit clauses? Do, do you have any thoughts on, on you know, how we, how we encourage um, those who don't wish to, to do the best to, to do the best? Because I do agree that, that the for commercial forestry is important to our economy, but we have to make sure it's not, it's not a cost or too much yeah. of a cost. Um, I'm not aware to, of the specific case with which you refer to, so I can come back on that if you provide me with uh, the specific case in detail. Um, in terms of community, our minister, um, Mary, uh, Mary McAllen, has, has made it quite clear that uh, what is really important, as well as climate change mitigations and the biodiversity and climate crises, is community engagement, community benefit, just transition, community wealth building. And so we're developing our public register, which is a consultation mechanism around building creation and felling permissions and long-term forest plans to strengthen the community engagement through that by linking that to the Scottish Land Commission, guidance on engaging communities around decisions on land that affect them and also a land rights and responsibility statement um, in the land use uh, legislation. So we are seeking to do much more about much better, much more integrated community engagement and community benefit and woodland creation and sustainable forest management in future. Uh, I don't. I, I, our our guidelines for grants are well laid out on our website, and so I don't know why a community group wouldn't be successful. It doesn't sound doesn't sound right that, but I'm more than happy to follow that up if I can get the details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Irina Russell, I noticed you were nodding along quite a bit to some of that, and I just wondered if you maybe wanted to contribute. Um, yes, I'll contribute because you've given me the opportunity. Um, so for, for us in terms of the, I'll just answer it a bit, if that's okay, on the encroachment of um, Sitka spruce non-native species into ancient woodland sites. The way we would view this issue, the trust, is that there are two, two parts um, to this issue. There are plantations on ancient woodland um, sites, so this is in the past. It's not a practice that's being done at the moment, so that is absolutely a, an improvement to the way to sustainable forest management in Scotland. In the past, native woods used to be underplanted uh, with conifers, or, or ancient, and that creates a plantation on an ancient woodland site. So restoring these uh, would bring these woods back to a, um, um, an, being an ancient, a restored ancient woodland. So there's a pause issue. Uh, that's what we call them, an acronym, um, that were planted with conifers there. Uh, we need to, to restore those. So we have an example of that at the Woodland Trust. It's our site at Lahar Cake that was planted. It's a Caledonian pine woodland as an NGO. We're putting resource into that to restore it. Um, and that work is, is underway at the moment. Now, there's also the issue of um, current Sitkas proceeding into ancient and native woods, and particularly in, in open habitat. So that's an issue where we manage a site and the seed sources within our site, we will uh, address that um, issue and we'll remove it. Um, but I think also there's an issue of particularly around like bigger uh, plantations or you have mature. Uh, Sitka spruce is very good at seeding uh, all around and it gets into other people's sites, for example. I don't know that who, you know, the costs or why should we kind of spend public money to remove someone else's um, seedlings so there might be grants available but and can you always go and find these uh, <laughs> trees before it's it's too late um, so there are there are concerns um, for us around this but it's the two plantations on ancient woodland sites we need to put clear targets in our biodiversity strategy that we can secure all of those sites and ensure they're not in critical condition by 2030 and you know the, by 2045 I think it is realistic to restore uh, these or have them under restoration. Um, but there's also the issue of um, Sitka seeding. Um, sometimes, you know, it's within our own site, so we can manage that. But, you know, if it goes from some another site to another one landowner to another, I, yeah, there's, there's issues there to, to consider how that um, should be addressed. Okay. Okay. Andrew Weatherall. And then yeah. I, th I think I'd really like to come in on that point that Arena made for the Woodland Trust from an RSPB point of view. So I, I like to think that we have quite a good join up um, from, from um, your, the people invited into the room, the stakeholders here around deer and rhododendron. So uh, I think it's predominantly about the, the issue of the invasive non-native conifers 
Um, and that is an issue for peatland restoration as well in the flow country, for example, and on high conservation value uh, open habitats. So it's not, it's not restricted to forestry and maybe it's a wider issue that needs to be considered elsewhere where the, you know, the principle of the polluter pays does not apply because it should apply, but it doesn't apply because there is an exemption for these non-native conifer species because they're used in commercial forestry, is, is my understanding of it. As far as the UK forestry standard goes, I just wanted to make the point that, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, a well-intentioned document that improves, I think, with every iteration of it. And as stated, it's going under, uh, it's under review at the moment, so we look forward to to more changes around maximum of a single species and, and other issues. But one of the main challenges, I think, with the UK forestry standard is it kind of stops at the forest edge. It is about the management of, of the woodland, not what's beyond, which could be open habitat, could be peatland restoration, or it could be somebody else's ancient woodland. So I think I think the issue is, is wider than forestry in this instance, more about kind of land use strategy issues of which forestry is one important component. So just to put the context there from our perspective. Paul Sweeney. Yeah, this has been a, thank you, Convener. This has been a really interesting um, discussion because I think it's establishing where the balance lies between positive incentives to do to, to undertake best practice and management and also whether there are sufficient penalties for malpractice um, and I think I'd be interested to get the view of the, the, the group on where that balance should be lying. I think um, the petitioner has presented an example from Argyll um, of an, a landowner, a private landowner, who had cleared 21 square metres of ancient woodland um, and I believe they, they were reported to Forestry Scotland and that there was actually a, an enforcement um, exercise pursued um, but then apparently that has quietly been dropped. Um, I think the, the penalty was something like £5,000 per tree felled. I think that's the, 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 the level of penalty I levied. But I'm, more, I'm concerned that in a, quite an egregious breach of the 2018 Act, the enforcement wasn't pursued. So I'm just, uh, is there a problem with enforcement? And again, to the point that was raised um, earlier on about the issue of you know public money being used to sort of clean up other people's mess. <laughs> Uh, are we are we actually got a bit of a perverse situation here, where you know the community is cleaning up for private interests that are profit, profiting from the land, but aren't contributing aren't contributing anything to cleaning up their contamination or bad practice? So, uh, uh, Claudia Rose first. Ah, oh, thank you. I think my microphone's working now. Um, I was just going to pick up the previous question, so I haven't got an answer to um, Paul Sweeney's uh, question about the regulation and incentives. But just to pick up um, from our understanding about the impact of encroaching um, tree species from plantations, the only evidence we've got is that while it does happen, it's very relatively small impact. So I just wanted to make that small clarification. Thank you. Would someone like to pick up the... Doug, Henderson, uh, Doug Harrison. Thank you. Um, we certainly would not condone 21 hectares of clearance of ancient woodland. Uh, so just metres square, not hectares. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that, would be, that would be extreme. 20, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And uh, we would always uh, pursue that. Um, I mean, if it, if it had been consented through planning, uh, well, then uh, we, would, it, we would pursue for legal felling. But if it's been consented through planning, that tends to trump the legal felling um, process for us. But what we do do is to um, place a restock direction on people who have felled ancient woodland and any woodland that's protected uh, to ensure that they replant that woodland. Uh, generally, we like that to happen where it's been felled, but sometimes it can, it can happen in a, in a separate location, but not on an ancient woodland site, so we'll follow that up. Okay. That's, that's helpful. And how easy is it to enforce or compel the land owner or the landlord to, to comply with, with those instructions? An illegal failing is a fairly difficult thing uh, to gain to, to be successful on. And so uh, we need to choose our cases very carefully because we want to make sure we get a prosecution. And part of the 2018 Act that came into the Forest and Land Scotland Management Act 2018, which came into force on the 1st of April 2019, 
That does allow us, on a majority of cases, to issue a restock direction because it's so difficult to achieve a prosecution. Um, and you get into all manner of discussions like when is a tree dead and when is it alive? You get into those kind of minutiae in a, in a prosecution. So the restock direction uh, is a means to overcome those difficulties by saying, even if we don't get a, even if we decide not to prosecute you, we're going to issue a restock direction, which is a legal compulsion on you to replant. That they can appeal against the restock, restock direction, and then that can get a wee bit bogged down. But it's another tool, if you like, for us to use um, to help protect not just ancient woodland but all woodland. That's helpful, and I suppose that the issue, I suppose, with a restock is if you've felled a load of trees that have been around for centuries, it's going to take another hundred years for them to recover that that landscape to recover. I suppose so. It's a kind of, you know, it feels like the damage is done sort of thing, and it's a somewhat yeah. permanent basis, at least in a human's lifetime. Uh, well, if, if we know that the felling is going to take place, and we can get there before it's completed, we can issue a stop notice, a legally binding stop notice to stop any further activity. If we don't know that the trees have been felled until it's happened, we are as upset as, if it, as anyone else is in an ancient woodland. And the best we can do is to get that replanted as quickly as possible. I mean, ancient woodlands are, and native woodlands are special places. There is a seed bank in the ground. And so they will regenerate. Mother Nature is a wonderful thing. And they will regenerate. But if we can get there before it happens, we can issue a stop notice. Yes. Sorry, it was just to, as a supplement, do you think something like a fixed penalty scheme um, to immediately, you know, in place a financial penalty on a, an infringement of such a nature, like, would help to drive behaviours in a better way? Um, if there was a big, if there was a, if there was a beefier or a more robust sanction uh, on bad practice, it would probably drive behaviours. Um, as you said, the prosecution is so difficult to achieve that, you know, you might end up in a situation where it's hardly a viable um, sanction. Um, and you're kind of trying to then kind of bolt the stable door after the horse is bolted, sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, if we do manage to get a prosecution for legal felling, we got one a couple of years ago in Grampian, that person has a criminal record, okay. and they've been fined £5,000. So there is some, there is, there is some, I wouldn't like a criminal record, so there is some teeth if we do manage to get a prosecution, mm -hmm. but it is, it, is, it is difficult. Okay. Thank you. Irina. Russell was keen to come in. Yes. Um, there was a point that was made earlier, I think it was perhaps Doug uh, made the point that if you have consent through planning permission, you can go ahead and fell the wood. We've just said at the beginning of this that our, our planning protections policies are, are improving, uh, but the current protections are not afforded enough protection in planning. So it's just, it's really is a little bit unfair uh, or maybe more than just a little bit that, uh, you know, planning permission can actually trump, uh, uh, you know, the need to fell ancient woodland. We also had cases because we get um, contacted by members of the public a lot um, on um, cases of suspected illegal felon. We've had positive um, kind of communications with Scottish forestry colleagues in the conservancies. They've gone out and investigated as soon as possible, or we're aware of cases where the communities, you know, their eyes and ears on the ground. They've uh, let us know, we've advised what to do, go and contact Scottish Forestry. They've gone and like served those, those stop notices. Of course, ideally we don't get to that and we should have that aim and well communicated that we want to see no further loss of ancient woodland. And we should think, you know, we need to do more to let people know that it is absolutely unacceptable to have loss of, of an irreplaceable habitat being ancient woodland and other irreplaceable um, habitats. We're also aware of, of cases where, you know, I think the felling was considered too insignificant to kind of go to prosecutions and go through all the all the motions. But generally, we've had um, many cases where appropriate action was, was taken and it was just um, really helpful to work with colleagues in, in Scottish forestry conservancies um, on that. So we've had positive experiences, but... I know not everybody has experienced that. Um. Thank you. I mean, actually, an hour has evaporated uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and before I bring this session to uh, an end, I'd just like to go back to each of you just for any reflections on the conversation we've had or a point that you think we've missed or not focused on 
enough that you would just like to leave us uh, with a thought on. Uh, and I'll, I haven't heard, we haven't had, heard from Andy for a little while, so Andy, if I can come to you, you've obviously been able to hear much of what's been being said. Is there anything you would like to leave us with as a final thought? Um, just uh, to add to one or two things from the previous conversations, um, when we were talking about um, private landowners and, and how they contribute to the management of ancient woodlands, etc. The, the grant scheme is, is well recognised for the Woodland Improvement Grant, and that's probably why most of our landowners are applying to, to fence rather than do anything else. It goes back to the recognition that herbivores are the kind of um, largest threat to ancient woodlands. So, if a private wood, woodland owner, they're looking to fence out those deer. So, that's why um, the Woodland Improvement Grant is, is, is very important to us. On the the incursion, if you like, of um, seed sourced uh, introduced species, will come, whether it be spruce or hemlock or, or sycamore. In fact, uh, I was pleased that Claudia um, made the point that it is a local issue, um, but, it, but it's not prevalent across, across the country. Um, but, but that's a, the main point I wanted to make. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. Andrew Weatherall. Uh, yes, thanks, convener. I one of the questions that might have come up was about uh, international examples. So I just wanted to say I didn't actually have any because I want Scotland to be the international example on this of leading on ancient woodland protection and improvement. Mine's a UK wide role with the RSPB and I'd like to be able to go into the other devolved nations and say, look at Scotland, especially following the Glasgow declaration on forests and land use which really prioritised conserving and improving uh, natural woodlands. And I just want to finish with the last point which is that it's the 30th anniversary of the Earth Summit in Rio this year. Uh, principle 3 stated the right to development must be fulfilled so as to equitably meet developmental and environmental needs of present and future generations. So my argument would be that the best time to protect and improve ancient woodlands was 30 years ago. The next best time is right now. Thank you very much. Uh, Claudia. Um, thank you. I, I just think my last point will be to really re-emphasise, I think, the point that everyone's agreed about the high biodiversity value, about how we you know, welcome this petition coming forward. Um, and I think the other key point is a lot has been done to work on the protection and improvement of biodiversity, but there's a lot more still to do. And the next 10 years the, is going to be critical to make sure we implement the issues we've been discussing here to make sure that we do halt biodiversity loss. The policies are in place and they're coming forward in the parliamentary program. The new environment bill is going to have statutory targets for nature, which will also um, be important. So I think the steps are there, but it is going to need ongoing scrutiny to make sure we're all held to account and they're implemented. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Doug Howison. Thank you. So, um, first of all, just thank you to the petitioners and the committee for giving us a chance to have this conversation. It's, it's been really great to have this conversation, so thank you for that. Secondly, to thank Claudia and Nature Scott for reaching out to us uh, to work together as delivery partners, because the threat of deer to our ancient woodlands is huge, and we've got to get to the bottom of that. Uh, and then thirdly, just to say to you, as the committee, if you haven't spent any time in an ancient or native woodland, go to Native Woodland of, Native Woods Survey of Scotland on the internet and find your local ancient woodland. And going to stand in it is fantastic. Thank you. And out of interest, where is the nearest native ancient woodland to where we are just now? It's probably on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Oh, maybe, maybe we will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for an outdoor outing. <laughs> that might actually be quite useful to us. And finally, uh, if I can come to Arena Russell. Well, I guess on that point, I could extend an invitation to Woodland Trust sites to the committee, should you wish to have an, an outing. So we'd be delighted to, to host you. And we have um, your privilege to look after sites up and down 
Scotland, so please visit, including rainforests. It's just really fantastic to see. Um, okay, um, I'm really glad to see there's agreement on, on the deer management issue and we all stand ready to, to work together. It will require collaborative um, effort to do this. Um, we'd like to see a policy aim for no further loss of ancient woodland. Um, and as Claudia um, from Nature Scott also noted, uh, we have the upcoming biodiversity strategy. We'd really like to see not just ancient woodlands, but all of, of nature and biodiversity better prioritized and better uh, funding if we're really to address uh, and reverse nature's decline. But we should see or we need to see uh, targets to protect and restore our ancient woods and that biodiversity strategy is our next best opportunity. We also have the opportunity to implement uh, or include legal protections for, for ancient woodlands in our upcoming environment bill. It's expected in the third uh, year of, of this parliament and we are really grateful um, for, for that commitment to bring forward a bill with uh, nature restoration um, targets. We welcome the commitments made by government around Scotland's rainforest, ancient woodland register, deer management. And like I said before, we're all waiting. Um, so we want to collaborate. We want to provide expertise as a leading environmental NGO. Um, and you know, Parliament needs to ensure ongoing scrutiny of these issues and implementations of uh, and delivery of, of these commitments. And finally, I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to give uh, evidence to you today and it's been lovely to be back in Parliament after too long actually, so thank you. And thank you, and thank you all very much. That's actually been incredibly helpful, and I quite like the idea of we're coming into the summer. I quite like the idea of actually sensing the thing uh, for ourselves, because it's it's something I think potentially we all think we know about. We all certainly have an investment in it, uh, and it would be, uh, I think, from everything we've heard, there are some serious issues underpinning this petition that I think the committee will want to reflect on uh, in the light of all the evidence you've given us this morning and in the uh, evidence we've heard from the petitioners. So can I thank you all, those of you who have come, those of you who, are the, who have been joining us virtually. That's been very helpful. Uh, and I now suspend the, this meeting of, Parliament, uh, of, the, of the committee again briefly.
Okay, and let's continue now with the uh, balance of agenda item one, <laughs> uh, which is the consideration of continuing petitions. Uh, petition number 1856, supporting the taxi trade. Um, a petition lodged by Pat Rafferty on behalf of Unite. Uh, members will recall the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to protect the future of the taxi trade by providing financial support to taxi drivers, setting up a national stakeholder group with trade union driver representatives, reviewing low emission standards and implementation dates. And at our last meeting of the committee, we agreed to write to key stakeholders, seeking information directly from those in the sector. In particular, the committee sought figures on the number of taxi licence holders prior to the, 2019, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic and the current number and we've received responses so far from 12 local authorities and the Scottish Taxi Federation. And five of those local authorities provided details of taxi and private operator figures, which indicated that there were 3,748 operators before the pandemic, uh, and that has now fallen to 3,258. This illustrates a reduction of 490, with four out of five local authorities seeing a reduction in the number of operators in the area. Twelve local authorities provided details of taxi and private driver licences, which indicated that there were a total of 11,436 licences before the pandemic, but now 9,348. And that's a reduction of 2,088, with 11 out of 12 local authorities seeing a reduction in driver licences, nearly 20%. Uh, which is pretty significant. The Scottish Taxi Federation's response highlights a number of other issues for their members, including an ageing workforce. Um, I think I read taxi drivers are in their mid-50s now and increasingly older than still. Low emission zones and what impact they may have on the viability of many of the um, taxis that have been the investment of their owners. And the high cost of low emission zone compatible vehicles uh, and I imagine, although it hasn't been suggested in advance of today's meeting, but a very immediate challenge could well be the price of uh, fuel, um, which we know is going to be affected by the current international s situation. So in the light of all of that, I certainly found my own local authority reduction in taxes quite significant, given the challenges there are post-pandemic for the restoration of bus services and also rail services, uh, that there was a 20% reduction in the number of available taxis and that this could become an increasingly difficult to obtain and even more expensive option. Uh, I think there are some really serious issues underpinning all of this here. Do colleagues have any comments or suggestions as to how we might proceed? Paul Sweeney? Sorry, I thought you were going... I don't know if you were, actually. Well, <laughs> I, I just... I, I thought I'd put on record um, a written question that I'd submitted to... Um, Scottish Government on um, the question I submitted was to ask the Scottish Government whether it would consider providing grants to support taxi drivers to upgrade their cars to sustainable low emissions vehicles. I understand one of the big issues currently facing taxi drivers in Glasgow is the imminent implementation of a low emission zone in the city centre and certainly the petitioner, um, the, the trade union representing taxi drivers in the city, you know, uh, of which I'm a member so to declare relevant interest. Um, has indicated this could significantly reduce further the, the already difficult situation facing the taxi trade. So reducing numbers further, potentially killing the trade altogether in the city. I know certainly from anecdotal experience that it's very difficult to get a taxi in Glasgow, especially uh, on you know weekends when it's busy. Um, so just to indicate on the record what the Scottish Government um, said in reply to my written question, um, they said that the Scottish Government currently offers a number of funding schemes through Transport Scotland to support businesses, including taxi owners, make the shift to low and zero emissions vehicles. Applications for these funds can be made through the Energy Saving Trust to administer the schemes on our behalf. The available support includes the Switched On Taxi Loan Scheme, which offers an interest-free loan of up to £120,000 to enable taxi owners and operators to replace their current vehicle with an eligible ultra-low emission vehicle. The Low Emission Zone LEZ, uh, LEZ Retrofit Fund for taxi owners operating within LEZs. This provides up to 80% grant funding to replace existing diesel engines to meet the Euro 6 standard for driving within a low emission zone. The grant provides up to £10,000 per wheelchair accessible taxi, installing repowering technology or £5,000 per taxi, installing exhaust after treatment systems. And the Low Emission Zone Support Fund, which is available to eligible micro businesses and sole traders, including taxi operators, Operating within a 20 kilometre radius of a low emission zone, the fund provides a £2,500 grant towards the safe disposal of non-compliant vehicles as an incentive 
to take older and more polluting vehicles off the road. Um, so those are the schemes available. What I would suggest is that some of them, for example, the first one, the switched on taxi loan scheme, sounds like it would meet more than meet the cost of a vehicle replacement, but the other ones don't seem to come close to meeting the actual capital outlay that a driver might face uh, in trying to replace a vehicle that doesn't meet the standards. So I think there's a gap there that needs to be interrogated. So okay. that, that and point. one of the suggestions before us is that we might actually have an evidence session around this uh, uh, petition at a later date, uh, which might allow us to bring that point in. Alexander Stewart. I, 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 I would agree with that, Convener. I think an evidence session would be really very important. Uh, I was surprised and also shocked at the number across the local authorities. Uh, I mean, obviously, nighttime economy and other packs in, in communities have had, a, had an impact, uh, but there is a massive erosion here of, of, of this industry. Uh, and it would be really useful for us to collect some information from uh, the Federation themselves uh, to come and the petitioner uh, to give us an update as to where this is. Because, as I say, it's, it, if it's not stopped or if it's not supported, then there could be a massive uh, issue in some communities at uh, the length and breadth of Scotland uh, in the demise of taxis. And I think I would still like to hear from some of the other local authorities, mm -hmm. too, that we've not heard from so far, because there are some big local authorities involved in all of that. Um, as well. David Torns. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Can I just put on record, and I'm going to bring that point up, at the 12 local authorities who did respond to call for evidence, I'd like to thank them for that. Out of uh, 32 local authorities, that's, that's pretty poor. We all have uh, licensing boards in place. Um, I support uh, the call for evidence to bring them before the committee, but I would also like to write to the Scottish Government to highlight the decrease in taxi drivers by 20% to see what they would be able to do or in to, are they going to monitor the situation and see what you could do to encourage people back into the taxi business? Yeah, no, I think that on the, in the light of the submissions that we've received identifying the reduction, it would be useful, I think, to actually draw that uh, evidence we've obtained to the Scottish Government so, so that they are aware of it. But yes, I agree. I mean, it, 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 there are local taxi uh, licensing boards, and so I would have expected that we would get a fuller response. Um, so are we content that at some later date, uh, I mean, we have quite a full schedule ahead, but I think this is going to be an ongoing issue uh, that we'll seek to have an evidence session around the issues raised by the petition. Thank you. Uh, petition number 1866 is to introduce legislation to improve bus, bus travel for wheelchair users. Uh, in, uh, lodged by Daryl Cooper, and the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to introduce legislation so that wheelchair users can face frontwards when travelling on a bus. At our last consideration, the committee agreed to write to Pam Duncan Glancy, uh, MSP, to seek her views on the petition. Uh, and I'm pleased to say we have a response from uh, Pam. Uh, which sets out a number of issues for wheelchair users attempting to access bus services, including a lack of accessible buses that can lower to allow wheelchairs on board, no seating at some bus stops, meaning people with mobility problems cannot wait for the bus without being actually in quite significant pain or distress while attempting that, poor joined-up transport, meaning that some routes are only partly accessible by a bus but not the balance of the route, only one wheelchair user being allowed in a bus at a time, uh, meaning that wheelchair using couples or friends have to then split up. Uh, and that, of course, you know, can be very unhelpful at the best of times. But if you're travelling late at night, uh, is particularly challenging for uh, wheelchair users. So I think um, we were slightly unimpressed with the responses we received prior to writing to Pam Duncan Glancy. I think we thought there was a bit of fudge in some of what we'd heard. Do members have any comments or suggestions in relation to this just now? Um, Ruth McGuire. Commissioner, I think, I think this is a really um, important matter. I think um, Pam Duncan Clancy's response showed that it, it warrants a sort of full investigation. And I wonder if that might be a, a subject matter committee um, for them to, to take on, whether that be um, the Transport Committee or the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. I don't I don't know, but um, I think it would be helpful for a committee of this parliament to properly and fully investigate this. Are, are members con uh, content if we ask the clerks just to sound out and see whether there's any indication that one of the, su the appropriate subject committee might be able to take this on and do a bit more work with it? Paul Sweeney? Yeah, I, I agree with that, um, Convener. And I also just wanted to emphasise that there are provisions in the 2019 Transport Act to provide the additional conditionality on operators um, to adhere to certain standards, whether it's through bus service improvement partnerships, 
um, fa franchising, although I don't believe a franchising scheme is established in Scotland as of yet, um, or direct public ownership in the case of Lothian Buses, for example, which is owned by the council, uh, councils of Edinburgh. Um, what I would suggest is perhaps asking the Scottish Government what additional scope there is to introduce conditionality on operators to adhere to standards that improve accessibility. Um, I think there's definitely leverage, given the significant num amount of public subsidy of the industry, um, to, to attach better conditions. Great. Um, yeah. OK, fine. Thank you. OK. Um, petition number 1870, to ensure teachers of autistic pupils are appropriately qualified. A petition lodged by Edward Fowler, calling on the Scottish Government to introduce legislation requiring teachers of autistic pupils to be appropriately qualified in order to improve educational outcomes. And the petitioner points out that special conditions apply to the employment of teachers of hearing impaired and visually impaired pupils, noting that teachers are required to obtain appropriate qualifications. Uh, the petitioner suggests that the same principles should be applied to those teachers working with pupils of autism. And we last considered this um, at the beginning of December, and we agreed to write to the teaching unions. We've received a response from um, the uh, NASUWT and from the petitioner. Uh, the union notes that initial teacher education is just one element in supporting the wellbeing of pupils, and that improved initial teacher education will not provide a quick fix on its own to guarantee that appropriate ASN support is available to all schools, teachers and learners across Scotland. It also notes that initial teacher education already covers a wide range of issues and in order to add a new topic in consideration would need to be made of which existing topic to remove. So the submission also highlights pressures on teachers arising from an ongoing reduction in specialist support for pupils with additional support needs, including in relation to managing challenging behaviour in classrooms. Uh, in his submission, the petitioner points to a wider issue which he believes is that pupils are becoming overwhelmed in mainstream classrooms and uh, really they are there unable to cope. And the petitioner explains that many teachers are just not sufficiently trained to manage children with autism and co-occurring co co conditions and says that without the right support and strategies, this can trigger some challenging behaviours. And the petitioner believes that the system at the moment is failing both the teachers and the children. Do any members have any comments they would like to make? Alexander Stewart. I have gr a great deal of sympathy, uh, convener, with the petitioner uh, indicating and also with the union who have identified. Uh, and it obviously is a much larger issue uh, for schools today to have uh, a number of individuals within the classroom who, who, res who require uh, additional support to do their mainstream education. Uh, but in doing that, it has a detrimental effect potentially on the rest of the class. Uh, and I think that the, the, the petitioner makes some very strong views on all of this. Uh, and I'm aware within my own uh, local authorities and my own region that there are issues uh, specifically with this. Uh, so I, I do believe that uh, there's a lot more that could be looked into. Uh, and, uh, and it would be useful to write to the Scottish Government to, to ascertain uh, what is uh, the, the assessments that are taking place uh, within uh, the teacher training uh, and, uh, and the way going forward and, to, and the guidance uh, that's produced to help uh, uh, recognise the links between uh, the communication needs of certain children and the behaviour that takes place within a classroom. Uh, because the strain on the teachers uh, is immense. I mean, uh, there was a question on the, on the last week at, at First Minister's questions about the, the knock-on effect in Aberdeen uh, that was happening uh, and the report that had appeared uh, uh, that there was daily uh, situations in classrooms uh, because of children with specific needs uh, that weren't being addressed and, and the burden that was putting onto the teacher and a large number of them were uh, contemplating leaving the profession because of that. So I do think that there is real scope for us to look at this. Any other comments or suggestions? Are we happy to proceed on that basis? I think we could write to the Scottish Government then, uh, seeing whether it intends to undertake uh, a child rights impact assessment into initial teacher training. Um, and CPD of uh, continuous professional development for teachers to ensure that the needs of all children with additional support needs, including those with autism, are being met, and to produce guidance for teachers along the lines that Alexander Stewart was just discussing there. Are we content with that, colleagues? We are. Uh, petition number 1871, which is a full review of mental health services, 
uh, uh, which has been lodged by Karen McCown on behalf of Shining Lights for Change. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to carry out a full review of mental health services in Scotland to include the referral process, crisis support, risk assessments, safe plans, integrated services working together, first response support and the support available to families affected by suicide. Now, members may be aware that this petition arose from the petitioner's own experience. The petitioner's partner, Luke, died by suicide in 2017 asked, after asking for mental health support up to eight times in the week before his death. And I, I remember we were quite affected by the uh, submission as received when we first considered it. Once again, Monica Lennon, MSP, is joining us, uh, having an interest in the petition. I'll come to Monica in a moment. Um, at the last consideration of the petition, the committee agreed to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care and key stakeholders. And we've received several detailed responses, which I'll try to summarise very briefly. In his response, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care highlights how the Scottish Government plans to improve mental health support across Scotland, including providing additional funding, improving how systems work together and establishing service standards and investing in community support for adults. The Scottish Government and COSLA will publish a new suicide prevention strategy in September of this year, which will be accompanied by an initial action plan. A lived experience panel is also being set up so that people who lived with lived experience can advise on and inform mental health policy development. In its submission, the Scottish Association for Mental Health suggests that almost one in four adults continue to wait longer than four months to access psychological therapies. Uh, Sam H's research into service users' experiences of mental health services during the pandemic revealed that over a quarter of respondents indicated that their specialist treatment and support had stopped altogether because of the pandemic. I'm an experience of my own constituents, so I, I'm sure that is probably quite widely the experience of MSPs too. Uh, the petitioners provided two further written submissions to the committee. The first summarises a freedom of information request she made to NHS Lanarkshire, and that revealed that 74% of patients were not admitted to hospital after attending A&E for mental health reasons. And the second is in response to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care's submission. The petitioner states that whilst she welcomes the increased funding, it's actually crucial to establish how this funding will now be used, noting that a review is necessary, the review <coughs> being the aim of the petition, is necessary to determine which areas are failing and need reconstructed. She also suggests that a specialist crisis centre for mental health is needed. And I wonder if Monica Lennon would like to contribute further at this point. Monica. Thank you very much, convener, and to the committee for having me be back. Um, I'm really grateful for the work that's been done and the submissions that have been made, and I welcome much of what the Cabinet Secretary has, has also said. Um, I had a, a, a brief chat with Karen this, this morning. We're in regular contact. Um, and she's really grateful for the committee's attention um, to, to the petition. And she knows that, that you all understand because of your own local experience helping constituents. Um, I was quite struck by some of the comments. I think if I can look at the Sam H response, um, it really stands out that they're saying that you know recovering and renewing the previous system will not be good enough um, and I think they're absolutely correct um, with that and I think the Royal College of Psychiatrists um, again I've made some really important points and they talk about needing a, a radical a radical refresh of the current mental health strategy and importantly they talk about the experience of the workforce who are already stretched, who are already very tired and exhausted. And we know that, that burnout is a real issue for clinicians and, and people uh, on the front line of, of healthcare roles. Um, you know, I, I do hope that the, the petition can be kept open and that we can do everything possible to make sure that people don't fall through the, the gaps. I think government clearly have good intentions but I think there are legitimate questions about the additional resource how that will be used I think I go back to that point that Sam H make um, so eloquently about we have to do more than just recover and renew what the system was like before because we know the system was far from perfect um, we know that sadly too many people have fallen into crisis deeper into crisis and for many, um, that has resulted in them losing the, the, their lives. So we know that suicides can be prevented. So, so really, just here to again offer my support to, to my very courageous 
constituent, Karen McKeown. Karen has been a real rock to many other people who have found themselves in a similar dark place and, and her loss, nothing will ever make up for that. Um, Karen won't mind me saying as well that for her and her young children after Luke's death, it's been a battle. It's an ongoing battle to get support. Karen's son has autism. Um, her daughter has required ongoing support. Um, and I just want to be honest with the committee, uh, because I do represent people who rely on NHS Lanarkshire, um, and the support isn't always there. The waiting times are excruciating. That's not, not unique to Lanarkshire, as you know. So I think you know, we have to keep everything on the table. And I think we have to let people right across Scotland know um, that there is no complacency um, on here. Um, you know, people's lives absolutely are worth more than, than, than any amount of money. But I think the points that are being made by Karen about making sure that the money and resources get into the right places and I think continue to listen to lived experience and that includes, you know, many of the workforce who also have their own mental health issues. So, again, really, really grateful to the committee for all your, your time. I know you get a lot of petitions. This one is relevant to absolutely everybody in Scotland. And again, I know no matter what happens next, Karen is going to continue fighting to make sure that the system improves. Um, no one falls through the gaps. And, and those um, statistics that the community are read out, you know, Karen is beavering away on her own freedom of information request, but we know that when people present to A&E and don't get the help they need, we know that that is an appalling missed opportunity. And there is a, a space, I think, to provide more specialist support to try and make sure that we have a trauma-informed response right across the board. But thank you so much for, for listening today. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Uh, and and it, it, it is extraordinary in many respects. Uh, when I first came to this parliament in 2007, uh, so much of the discussion we were having in the chamber was about the destigmatisation of mental health. Many of the mental health charities and organisations changed their names to become uh, more accessible, uh, all of which was designed really in destigmatising mental health issues to encourage more people to come forward. And I think the problem we have is that notwithstanding the expansion of services that there may have been, the willingness now of people to come forward with quite acute uh, mental health conditions that probably previously they didn't, uh, it means that in some very acute situations, the help just isn't there as a consequence. Not, I think we all assume it is, but I think you know the evidence is increasingly that the pressure on all of this is very, very considerable. Uh, do any colleagues have any comments or suggestions as to how we might proceed? David Torrance? Thank you, Convener. Um, the petition is very important, but can I ask the clerks if they could check the Work Programme of Health, Social Care and Support Committee? Because if they're going to do an inquiry in it, I would like to pass it on to there. And if the petitioner, if they are doing it, if the petitioner could give evidence to that. Um, Thank you. That seems perfectly sensible. But notwithstanding that, if they're not, um, then I'd be very keen now actually to invite the petitioner to come to the committee. Uh, I think we would want to hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care about the issues underlying the petition, which is to have a full review of uh, mental health services. I think we might also be interested to know from the petitioner what her view is um, in relation to the uh, recruitment of the lived experience panel, um, which is being established, and to highlight that potentially as as a, as a very active opportunity for participation. Um, is there any other... Uh, a suggestion colleagues would like to make. Are we content to proceed in that twin track? Monica Lennon, thank you very much, and we'll keep the petition open and find out where we go from here based on any work that might be being done elsewhere in the Parliament. Thank you. Uh, petition 1904 changed Scots law to disqualify estranged spouses from making claims on an estate lodged by Christina Fisher, uh, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to define in law the difference between a legally married cohabiting couple and a legally married non-cohabiting couple for the purposes of ensuring that an estranged spouse cannot inherit their spouse's assets. Um, at last consideration, we agreed to write to the Law Society, to the Family Law Association, the Faculty of Advocates and the Scottish Law Commission, and we've received some very detailed submissions from the Scottish Law Commission and the Law Society of Scotland, which have been very helpful. 
members have had sight of both of these submissions in their papers, so I don't need to repeat in detail what was said. But some general points uh, from the Scottish Law Commission explaining that no legal definition of estrangement for the purpose of Scots family law. When spouses and civil partners separate, there is no change of legal status until they divorce or their civil partnership is dissolved. And the Commission notes that many couples who separate reach agreement on financial matters before that divorce or dissolution. The Law Society advises that in its response to the Scottish Government's 2019 consultation on succession law, it suggested a solution might be to use the test of living together as husband and wife or civil partners before the surviving spouse could inherit where there was no will to resolve current anomalies. And this submission acknowledges this test may be unfair to couples separated due to one partner being in long-term care. The Law Society of Scotland also suggests there may be merit in considering the potential introduction of a time requirement before excluding a survivor's prior rights and legal rights. And the submission notes that in, it is open to anyone to alter the terms of their will following a separation should they wish to do so. The Law Society of Scotland also notes that while there may be situations where a deceased person had no longer intended or wished for a separated spouse or civil partner to benefit from their estate, but they had not amended their will accordingly, that such hard cases would not merit altering the law, given the impact this might have more widely. So, a recognition of the issue, but clearly a view that tackling it might have much wider ramifications than the actual injustice potentially being addressed would merit. Do colleagues have any comments or suggestions? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, to the Scottish Government's submission that is going to do more research into this area, I wonder if we could close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders, but in doing so, see how the petitioner could feed into the submissions and the research that the Scottish Government is going to do. Any other suggestions? Are we content with that? Yeah, I think we will. I mean, it's an important issue, but I think given also that the legal experts don't support at the moment a uh, a action, then I think um, we want to just ask the Scottish Government what more it's going to do potentially uh, and close the petition at this stage. Um, agenda item number two is the consideration of new petitions and the first of them is uh, petition number 1923 to align the higher rate tax threshold to 37,501 in line with the rest of the UK. Uh, inviting the petitions committee to set the government's budget. <laughs> I think, in part, uh, and it's been lodged by Peter Watson. Um, and I know that this threshold was correct at the time the petition was submitted. The petitioner believes that this should happen due to the recent uplift in the block grant for Scotland and notes that the increased revenue to individuals and families will be recycled through the economy, creating growth whilst rewarding hardworking people. In its submission, the Scottish Government explains that while the UK Government announced what was described as a significant increase in the block grant for Scotland, in real times it believes, it believes there has been a cut in day-to-day -day funding in each year of the spending review. The Scottish Government goes on to state that it does not support the action called for in the petition, as it believes this would provide a tax break to higher income earners while disproportionately affecting those on lower incomes. Uh, do the committee have any views? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, in the submission from the Scottish Government, it highlights that it would lose £552 million to invest in public services. It also um, says it does not support what the petition is calling for, so I don't think there's anywhere for the Petitions Committee to take this, so I'm quite happy to close it under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess I might take issue with the Scottish Government's justification for uh, not taking the action forward. But I think it's pretty clear that the Scottish Government does not intend to, uh, and in the absence of any willingness in the Scottish Government to consider the aims of the petition, I'm minded to endorse the suggestion that we close the petition. Does that meet with the support of the committee? It does. Thank you. Um, petition 1924 to complete an emergency in-depth review of women's health services in Caithness and Sutherland. Lodged by Rebecca Weimer, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to complete an emergency in-depth review of women's health services in Caithness and Sutherland. The petitioner believes, uh, states rather, that she believes there is a Highland gynaecology crisis which predates COVID with funding funnelled into Orkney or Inverness. 
She believes that serious conditions such as ovarian cancer are potentially being missed due to a lack of specialist training for GPs and notes that there are currently no miscarriage, menopause or fertility services available in the area. The petition also highlights the logistical difficulties associated with patients from Caithness having to travel to Ragmore Hospital for help um, along roads which are often closed or dangerous to drive. Uh, in his submission, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care submissions explains that the Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport is actively engaging with her constituents on the issues raised in this petition and has now arranged to meet with NHS Highlands senior management and clinicians to discuss the delivery of gynaecology services and will feed back progress to her constituents. The Cabinet Secretary's submission also provides further information on scoping work for the creation of Centre of Excellence for Rural and Remote Medicine and Social Care, a community midwifery unit currently being built at Caithness General Hospital, improvements to maternity and neonatal units at Ragmore Hospital in Inverness, and coordination between transport and other agencies to explore how access to healthcare can be improved, specifically in relation to the A9 and A99. In her submission, the petitioner reiterates that all women need access to a gynaecologist and states that, to her knowledge, no in-person gynaecology appointments have taken place at Caithness General since 2019. And the petitioner is concerned that the Cabinet Secretary is unaware of how bad the situation with roads is in reality. She also suggests that the rural unit framework is incredibly successful for MRI machines, breast screening, cancer screening and more recently vaccination clinics. She suggests it might include appointments with a gynaecology nurse or consultant to filter out who needs to be on a surgical list and who could be treated in the short term to reducing waiting lists across the board. Um, do members have any comments or suggestions? Ruth McGuire. Convener, um, we are at a, a future evidence session hearing a, a number of petitions about healthcare in Keith Ness, and I would suggest that we invite the petitioner to join us there and we examine them all um, in that in that one session. While they're individually important and distinct, I think it's all part of the same uh, theme and it would be helpful to, to speak to everyone together. Indeed we are. We have uh, three petitions, I think, uh, 1845, 1890 and 1915 that touch on parallel issues. Uh, so I think that would be a very sensible suggestion. Are we content to combine this petition with those others we're hearing in relation to uh, Kate Ness and uh, to take matters forward on that basis? We are. Thank you. Um, our final new petition this morning is uh, 1925, which is a, a bringing the HGV speed limit on our major trunk roads to 50 miles per hour in line with other parts of the UK. It's been lodged by David Singleton, who points out that in Scotland, uh, the increase, the speed limit is now 40 miles per hour and is urging us to urge the Scottish Government to limit, uh, to increase this limit to 50 miles per hour so it's consistent. The Scottish Government states that in 2018 it conducted its own evaluation of the potential impacts of increased speed limits for HGVs in Scotland and found that there were small safety benefits and marginal environmental impacts in doing so. A pilot scheme which increased the speed limit for HGVs to 50 miles per hour on the A9 showed positive road safety benefits. So the Scottish Government is currently considering its policy in HGV speed limits as part of the National Speed Management Review. Um, while this review has already commenced, it will consider appropriate vehicle speeds for Scotland's roads and will include stakeholder and public consultation. The petitioner, however, remains unconvinced that the Scottish Government is planning to increase the HGV speed limit on major trunk roads, and he urges Scottish Government officials to travel with the driver of an HGV on the 100-mile A75 trunk road in both directions on the same day, one way at 40 miles per hour limit and the other at the higher speed, where it is safe to do so. And the petitioner believes that in doing this, it will give officials some idea of the problems caused by slow-moving traffic and some comfort in relation to an increase in the speed limit. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting, this one, because the petitioner has highlighted something the Scottish Government is looking at, but he's not convinced that it's necessarily going to lead to anything. Do members have any comments or suggestions for action? Can I suggest maybe even the... Sorry, David Tons. No, no, you go, no, well, I was going to suggest that we... I mean, the Scottish Government says it's having a view. I think we might reasonably ask for some clarity as to when they think all of this might come to some fruition. Um, and maybe ask 
uh, if there is any way in which the petitioner or others can engage with the Scottish Government in relation to the issues that are underlying. I'm not sure the Scottish Government will want to take up the offer of, of, a, of an HG lift up and down the A75, but um, I'm sure we would be very happy to draw that to their attention. But are we content with that, colleagues? We are. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's been a long morning. Uh, it's been a great morning, too, with our youngest ever petition, a very sensible and, uh, I think, worthwhile discussion on uh, woodlands and uh, a consideration of a number of important petitions. Can I thank everybody for their participation and confirm that the next meeting will take place on the 23rd of March. We have a brief item to discuss in private session, but I now close the public session. Thank you. <laughs>